The Hurling Show, brought to you in association with Torpy. Torpy are leading hurling into a new future with Bamboo, a revolutionary hurley created using their unique engineered hurling performance know-how. Already being used by many inter-county players, Torpy's Bamboo is highly sustainable, offers players greater striking distance and a more consistent balance every time, without compromising on natural feel. Check them out on the Torpy website and in the link below and enter the promo code OURGAME to get yourself 10% off. By God, we have a hurling show to bait all hurling shows today here on our game. Michael well, Verney, we've loads to talk about. Um, we want to talk about all the provincial or all the club championships. We want to talk about what's going on in Clare. Butcher, Henry Shefflin has uh, he's thrown it all up in the air, really, hasn't he? Yeah, it's unreal. Uh, it's the biggest... Um... It's the biggest shock and biggest kind of GA story in a long, long time, I have to say. Um, an absolute ball from the blue. The only I should have nearly pulled out some sort of a crown or gone to Burger King or something like that and worn a crown for, for this show. But the king is back uh, and the king is making his first foray into inter-county management. Um, there's so much to unravel here. There's so many strings to this. It's hard to know where to start. But do you know what? Uh, and everyone was talking about the Munster Championship for next year. And now all of a sudden, like the focus is like massively shifting towards the Leinster Championship, and that uh, that meeting in particular between Galway and Kilkenny, when when uh, it could be down in Olin Park, even I'm not sure when Henry comes up against Brian Cody. And there's so many; it, it really has uh, just lit a torch under the championship for next year already. And we're what the 21st of October. I was actually disappointed that they don't meet in the league next year. I was checking out the fixtures earlier. Like, so Liam Cattle has to go and, and play a Tipperary in the league next year. Wouldn't it be brilliant if Shefflin had to do so as well? If we were to go by the 2019 round robin, and we're assuming that it's, it's going to alternate based on the most previous recent or most previous meeting, that was in Nolan Park, which would suggest the next one is going to be in Pierce Stadium. Now, that would still be great because obviously Cody will have to bring his, uh, his band of Kilkenny men into. Do you know what? They might even be passing Shefflin on the road up. You know, you just don't know what way it's going to work out. But we've loads to talk about with this. Uh, just a reminder, we are brought to you by Torpy and the Bamboo Stick. Please do subscribe to the channel. Hit that button in the bottom right-hand corner there. We just topped 9,000 followers on uh, YouTube, which actually, the social reach is now over 57,000 people. But we just want to keep getting the numbers up on YouTube. Hugely important. And if you want the audio podcast, please go to patreon.com forward slash our game. Thanks very much to the people who are already following. Uh, a few more have followed in the last couple of days. So it would be great if more people could follow that to obviously drive it on to the next level and keep the keep the channel going. One thing, uh, I got this image sent earlier and I dickied it up a little bit. This is, a, I think this is an artist's impression of what Leinster is going to look like next year. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, Davy is the one who's been sacrificed there on the bottom, unfortunately, in this uh, little comic mock-up. You've got Matty Kenny there, Dara Egan, obviously uh, Cody in the middle, Seamus Cheddar Plunkett, and uh, Henry in there leading the charge. I just has got that check there advice. Yeah, I love that picture of Cody. That's the same one uh, that was sent out on Twitter this year when people were wondering who the culprit was for the hay bales falling on whatever, the M6 or M7. And just a picture of that Brian Cody smiling and smirking. <laughs> but um, D- Davey been on the ground. Davey is definitely the collateral damage in all of this. Um, and it looked like it was going to be, uh, from Tuesday's rumours anyway, it seemingly that it was going to be a 36th consecutive year at Inter-County, be it uh, playing or managing, but that is not the case. And he must be he must be sore enough man this morning because it did look like on from all the talk on Tuesday that he was definitely in prime position. And from what I'm hearing, he was in prime position until an 11th, it was kind of an 11th hour uh, Shefflin coming into the equation at a, a late, a late enough hour. It was only interviewed earlier on this week, from what I believe. So, yeah, um, Shefflin uh, has taken all the attention, but Davy will definitely be feeling sore this morning too. Yeah, because like, let's talk about yesterday and uh, how the story broke. So I'd heard the story during the day, during the afternoon yesterday, that he was going to get the, or sorry, that he had been interviewed by them or that he was in conversation with them. So, I mean, 
people obviously slate journalists all the time and, and like county boards give out if you put up a story and it's not 100% true. But like in general, they just try and keep you in the dark. So you, what you do is you try and go get a, get a couple of sources, try and stand up the story and put it out there. And uh, you don't, you, you generally, sometimes you bother with the county board, sometimes you don't. They're not going to tell you the truth anyway. So you just have to do your best to, to get sources to stack it up. So I was on the phone furiously yesterday trying to get people that might know the inside track, people in Kilkenny, people in Galway, have you heard this? One or two, yeah, I heard the rumour. So I put out the story, I think just before five o'clock, that link, the link had been made. So you'd leave it somewhat non-committal in terms of like, you're not inside the tent, so you don't know if the job is necessarily bit out there. But you, you were you were, you were the same, like you were yesterday, you'd heard the story and you were kind of there typing it up and ready to click to go live as well. So it's gas that a few, plenty of journalists were probably in the same boat with that story. Yeah, I kind of had the story uh, written up um, and ready to go, but it was, you know, firming it up 100%. You can't just, like, you can't just go and print anything. Like, you have to be, for all the people involved, for your own sake, for the, your publication's sake, be it our game or be it the Irish Independent or whatever it is, you have to be able to stand over the story as much as is humanly possible. Um, so it was kind of, there was just a flood of people nearly at the same at the same time when confirmation was kind of got her in around the same time and the story was out there. But when I heard it, I have to say, I, I didn't, I, there was a double or a triple take because I just, yeah, I, that, that I just didn't thing, believe like, it. No, yeah. this couldn't be real. No, and I was just like, it was, it, it was too unbelievable for me. And I, I, I had to like ask several times, is this actually the case? And um, it turned out it was, it turned out it was the case. It's definitely like, I, I can't think of, um, I can't think of, big, of a bigger managerial shock in, you know, a long, long time. To be honest with you, uh, the, the only one, the one that would really spring to mind is probably Davy resurfacing that quickly in Wexford after finishing up with Clare. Uh, it was within within 10 to 12 days, I think. That's, I, I, in terms of, you know, actually really, really grabbing their attention. But this is very, this was very left field. I know Shefflin was... Um, was in the equation or they wanted him uh, and were talking to him when Shane O'Neill was interviewed for the job. Yeah. But I just, it's just the idea of thinking that he would actually, you know, go outside Kilkenny and like the two teams that he's managed, he's with Ballyhale, who he obviously knows intimately, it's his home club, two, two all Ireland clubs, I think uh, 17 game on beaten run in the championship. And he's with Thomastown, which is a neighbouring club, which he knows well. And then to take the massive departure to go to manage Galway, which is, you know, minimum probably two and a half hours up the mm. road, not not on great roads. It just, it all seemed unbelievable to me. And um, With five it, young kids, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's nuts. It, re it really, really is. But um, it's definitely got the whole the whole world talking. Like everyone was, you know, I think it was Connor Moore. And I think you said it yesterday as well. Look, Newcastle, like, are making it, you know, an 11th hour bid for Shefflin and Richie O'Neill, who he's obviously taken up with him. That's another interesting aspect. Richie O'Neill has kind of been his, his right hand man, uh, probably along with his brother Tommy um, in Bally Hale and even in Thomastown at the moment. It'd be interesting to see what the rest of the backroom team looks like. I'd imagine it would be Galway based. Um, guys, that probably the Henry has played against, I would say, would. Could potentially be the four. You know, the likes of Damien Joyce he played with in WIT, I think. Yeah, uh, true. Uh, Greg Kennedy was one that jumped out to me, actually. Because <laughs> Henry obviously wrote in his book about the awful experience he had on him. Was it in 01 or 05? I can't remember. 01, I think. Yeah, I think it was and 01. How he learned so much from that. Greg has obviously got inter county coaching experience and is a Galway man. So that that's an interesting one. Other, other guys that would probably be close by would be the likes of probably Kevin Lally maybe that could be brought in or a Gavin Keary or somebody like that. But that's another fascinating aspect to this. Yeah. Uh, there's so much to this that just really whets the appetite. I, like you said there, that it is two and a half hours up to Galway each, t each time. We're talking probably minimum three times a week. Now, I'd say all the gym sessions and all that, you know, you, you let coaches and the S&C guys deal with all that. But that is a huge commitment. And, you know, I'd have a, like, it's many moons ago now that uh, I used to work in the in Bank of Ireland and deal with Henry. This would have been around 2007, I think, something like that. He, like, I found him to be very, very good at what he did, even though we didn't speak all that often because, you know, our work didn't really um, flow in the same direction. But, like, I think he'd have a big enough job down there. I think he was kind of based Watford then, probably... I'm not sure is he over the, the I'm not entirely sure what his job is, but I know he's got a decent job there 
and then obviously the five kids and then the huge commute. That's some going. I mean, how long can you even do that? Yeah, it's interesting. And Shane, on that as well, that raises the question then, everybody sees him as, you know, the front runner to succeed Cody whenever that happens. Um, now... Ooh, I don't know if he's going to... Like, will he be... Like, so number one... I don't know, like, is the reason that he went to Galway also because maybe he didn't get contacted about some of the Kilkenny under-20 job, the minor job? Obviously, the senior one isn't really up for grabs at the moment. Is it a case of, well, if I can't get it done from within, I'll get it done from without, and I'll show you what you're missing? I mean, obviously, that's speculation. Yeah, no, but potentially, um, that could be the case. and it, Like, it's maybe, he obviously, I think a lot of it is to do with oppor- uh, opportune timing. He didn't want to be, he didn't necessarily want to be Bally Hale manager. But it kind of landed there. They were beaten in a county semi-final. He felt they were underachieving. He jumped on board um, and they went on this incredible run. He took. He finished, I think, four days after they won the club all Ireland at the start of 2020. He took 2020 out. And then the opportunity came at Thomastown, obviously at the right time, geographically correct, uh, probably good, 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 good for him as well. Um, that's, what, that's what's real intriguing about this. It, it obviously felt right for him, uh, regardless of... Uh, you know, his, having a young family, regardless of the travel, it obviously felt like the right decision. And what I said there, that he's probably seen as the front runner to replace Brian Cody, you could be left with a situation now, I don't know when Kilkenny will become vac- vacant, if it will ever become vacant. But he has another job now. So let's just say hypothetically that the Kilkenny job becomes vacant this time next year. And he's after getting goal, winning a Leinster with Galway and getting to the Northern semi-final and he's building something. Then we have the Liam Cahill scenario of will he go back to Kilkenny or will he stay with the county he's at? That's only hypothetical, but that's... You You're have putting to the fat on the fire now. Yeah, you know, but you have to think about that. Yeah, yeah, you do, yeah. but you do. You have to think about that. And um, as well as that, you're kind of thinking, you know, if the Kilkenny job becomes available, let's just say two years, and TJ Reid is either nearing retirement or retired, and Richie Hogan is probably retired, and Walter Walsh, uh, Killian Buckley, Connor Fogarty, these guys are coming. Will that be the right time for him to take over? Does it make sense to be in another job and cut your teeth for three to four years and then come back to Kilkenny and then try and rebuild something with something new? It's just, I just think it's a really, uh, it's a really interesting part of the narrative as well. But like you and I, and I suppose everyone in the media and just the general GA public would assume that whenever that job becomes available, it's Henry Shefflin's in Kilkenny, if he wants, that it's his job and that's it. But there might be noses massively out of joint in Kilkenny now seeing this happen. Like, it's a huge story. I think a lot of Kilkenny supporters, I think every Kilkenny supporter always wishes Henry Shefflin the best, no matter what he does, because of what he did for him throughout his playing career. But there might be noses out of joint within the county board now. And I would be surprised if Michael Fenley isn't the next Kilkenny manager based on what's happening here also and obviously you would be keeping a very close eye on how he's going with Offaly but he's so massively well regarded so that would be my guess based on these developments yeah Jiz I I maybe you know something more than I do but I I don't know why Kilkenny knows as we be a joint with him going somewhere else if he you know if he wasn't offered a job or I don't know I mean in the county board now yeah yeah Yeah. okay I don't know whether um you know, whether he was offered a coaching role under Brian Cody or anything like that. But I presume he wants to be a manager and he wants to cut his cut his teeth there. I, I don't see, I think it's quite admirable to go somewhere else. Um, did Will they will they feel like they've been betrayed? <clears throat> I don't know. There'll definitely be, um, there'll be definitely an element of fear going around Kilkenny that this could come back to bite them. Now, I have to say as well that this... This will only be, like when he takes over Galway, that will only be his fourth year of management. He will have managed two years at Ballyhale and he would have man- managed one year with Thomastown. They're playing um, Saturday or Sunday week against Glenmore, which will, the cameras will be all over that game, I'd imagine, as well. But like he does probably, he does lack inter-county experience. But as I say, you probably have to start somewhere. Interestingly, Galway have taken a punt three times now, uh, a punt of sorts. Their, their last three managers... Uh, have been Michal Donoghue, who was an All Ireland club winning boss, first time at Inter County with Galway. Shane O'Neill, Inter uh, All Ireland club winning boss with the Pearshig, first Inter County gig, Galway. And Henry Shefflin, All Ireland double All Ireland club winning boss, first Inter County job with Galway as well. So I think that's another interesting side to it. Yeah, um, I put out a quiz, a Henry Qu- uh, Shefflin quiz, a little bit earlier on. 
made it tricky enough anyway. A few people have done it already. Fun quiz says Tram Spieler got nine. Six out of 15 and proud of it, says Mark Corcoran. How many did you get? That's It's a tough quiz, Shane. I won't lie. There's, there's a couple of ones. Listen, quizzes are no fun if you're getting 15. You need to feel a bit sick at the end of a quiz. You need to be like, oh, I should have known that. I only got I only got nine. I only got nine. And the thing that really annoyed me is, is I can't believe he's an Arsenal fan. I just yeah. have to put that out there. Can't believe he's an Arsenal fan. Just like Kilkenny, Kilkenny people, solid, reliable. Henry Sheffield as a player on the pitch, solid, reliable. You knew what you were going to get, classy every day. Arsenal, one of the most unreliable teams in sport. Which actually, Galway used to always be referred to as the Arsenal of the hurling world. So, yeah, well, there you go. There's your link. Loads of comments coming in here. Flash says, good morning, lads. Some shock with Henry getting the Galway job. Will be another, add another interesting narrative to the plot next year. Um, Trump's Beeler, note how even-handed and fair Kilkenny fans have been over their greatest player going to manage a direct rival. Contrast the hyster- her- hysterical reaction of Tip fans to Liam Cahill sticking with Watford. But it's not like he had the two of them handed to him and he chose. Imagine if Shefflin was offered both jobs right now and it was publicly known. <laughs> Do you think Kilkenny fans would be okay about it? Do you no, think they'd be all said, oh, yeah. They'd be going absolutely spare. Um, I have to say, uh, Shane, from a Galway point of view, um, there's been a pretty uh, toxic kind of vibe around Galway hurling and around the Galway County Board probably in recent weeks. And they've managed to pull off a massive coup here. And they do deserve, uh, while we don't like when things are kept under wraps and we like to know what's going on, they've kept this like literally under wraps until you know the day it was actually officially announced and i, I kind of equated to I kind of equated to um glenn ryan and his all-star team coming in in kildare so kildare uh were not in a good spot when jack o'connor basically you know traded kerry for kildare they were left without manager albeit he left him in a good spot kildare were and it was you know all sorts of rumors about who was going to get the job and who wasn't going to get the job and they pulled this all-star team and it was it's just pure saving grace and it's the same in Galway now I haven't if, if there has been any negative reaction to it I haven't seen it I've seen a wholesale positive reaction to it and Galway board of fairness they do have to uh, be commended for that mm, yeah definitely it, it really is Richie O'Neill going up there that's uh, as far as I know, that when Shefflin was rehabbing one of his injuries, it was the same for Richie O'Neill, and that's how they got close to each other. So he's certainly his right hand man, and I don't think it was any surprise when he was named as part of the ticket. Sure, it wasn't. No, I don't think so. It was uh, to be honest, it was either going to be him or his brother Tommy. I would have thought he, that he would take one, and it could be it. It well, could he, be. He's yeah, involved yeah. with uh, Brian Dowling's camogie outfit. Yeah, so. he's involved yeah. with the camogie. Yeah. Um, Richie O'Neill, uh, I think he's Kill Macau to the best of my knowledge. He would have been the third goalkeeper on the squad, um, but he would have always been very highly respected within the squad, um, even when he was uh, during his playing days. And he's obviously gone on to do very, very good things as a coach already. I think, he, think he's involved with Zurich. I'm fairly sure he works with Zurich, and he's a fairly high powering job there, as Shefflin has within Bank of Ireland. Mm. And it just goes to show you a lot of these guys are kind of high achievers. Um, that are involved at the higher end of inter-county. Uh, it has, it's going to be really interesting as well to see, like, we've seen Shefflin as a pundit with, you know, with the Sunday game and offering various views. But now he's thrown into the cauldron. He's going to probably get an opportunity at some stage next year to have a go at Limerick and try and take down the Limerick juggernaut. The greatest player of all time, uh, on probably the greatest team of all time, will get a chance to basically undo what potentially could be the greatest team of all time in Limerick now. It's just, it's absolutely, I have to say, it's absolutely fascinating. Yeah, the narratives just never end here. This thing hypes itself. David Connors of the Tomb Hurl tweeted yesterday, Henry Shefflin will be the new Galway manager. Um, he can't possibly cause us as much pain as he did as a player. Certainly an appointment I think supporters can get on board with. So, look, just to talk a little bit more about the whole Davy Fitz part and you know, I mean, his eye has been wiped in this situation. That will be a tough one to take. And, and I've no doubt that he'll bounce back and he'll be involved with another team. But as things stand in 2022, top level hurling, he won't be there. But jump back to 2017. So his, his Wexford team in his first season, they got knocked out in an All, All Ireland quarter final against uh, Wexford, or sorry, Watford, 123 to 119. Horrible game. Really was horrible. I don't think anyone enjoyed that game. 
But afterwards, there was a couple of tweets out from Henry Shefflin and Michael Dignan, who were analysts on, uh, on RT at the time. And Shefflin tweeted, who is marking who in this game? One would hate to be playing in the full forward line or be a forward full stop with this shock emoji face. I'm sure someone will do a screenshot of that now. I shouldn't have done that. Michael Dyke then, he also tweeted, sweepers should be outlawed, not the game I love. Coach players to tackle and to use their heads instead of using extra backs to compensate. So the managers at the time were Davy Fitz and Derek McGrath. So out, uh, out came um, Davy Fitz afterwards. He made a comment when he was asked about it. This is July 2017. I think Michael Dignan and Henry have had a go. Let me say this straight out. Michael Dignan and Henry have never managed any team at a high level. People need to wake up. So they do. If they want the same one or two teams to play hurling and be successful, that's fine. Myself and Derek are trying to bring teams to the fore that haven't been to the fore in a long time. And I'm very strong about this. It's great for the likes of Michael Dignan. He should have had an opinion on something recently and he didn't have it when he should have stood up. It's now time Michael Dignan stopped this mess. And and I'll jump on towards the end. Can I just say, Shane, isn't it hilarious now that Michael Dignan, uh, if you jump forward four years, is the awfully chairman who has turned the boat around. And now Henry Shefflin's, um, you know, a successful manager at club level and now going into inter-county manager and beating Davy for a job. Well, this is the thing, yeah. And also, you know, um, I think Dignan was involved in coaching and obviously then, like, with family situation, he couldn't uh, continue doing that, which he clarified afterwards in, in his own reply to Davy. But just to finish off, uh, to jump down some of that statement from Davy, he says, I think RT should go and have a look at themselves and get analysts who have been on the sideline and who know what the story is about. That's how I feel strongly about it. Easy, easy to knock people. I'd like to see their track records when it comes to it, when it comes to managing. It's a lot different to play, and I can promise you that. Now, my prediction is 2022, we, we're going to see Davy doing some analysis on TV, whether that's with Sky Sports or whether it's with RTE. And it's going to be involved in game, you know, a Galway game with Shefflin. And this story could rumble on a little bit more. To me, it's a little bit mouth watering. And I want to get the popcorn and, you know, give it all of that. It's almost like you're doing the Mr. Burns. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> so Excellent. I, someone texted me yesterday. Um, I just said, well, 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 and it's just like you know that in Father Ted, you know when the whole <laughs> she- when the whole sheep thing is on cover, it's like, well, well, well. What a pretty picture <laughs> Father Crilly has painted. Yeah, yeah it's just it's a, that's a not listen. I Davy won't be idle in in 2022. I can guarantee you that. And can I just say as well from Davy's point of view? Uh, you know, what an awful week as well. Six Mile Bridge comprehensively beaten in their drive for three in a row in Clare and then having made, you know, overtures to get the Galway job and, you know, by all accounts, being the man that they were going to go to and then for it to change at the, at the 11th hour. Um, a bad week for him. And now he's going to be on the Late Late Show, I believe, tomorrow night, promoting Ireland's fittest family. And uh, you mentioned that's going to be interesting. You mentioned about whether he'd be on RT or Sky Sports. I'd say it's an absolute no-brainer that he'd be on RT, given his RT links already. Yeah, it's going to be so interesting. Comment in from ML89. Could see an Ollie Canning, Eugene Clunan, Gavin Keary, Damien Joyce, David Collins type of person in the background team with him. Joe Canning, player selector, would be fantasy stuff. Here's the thing. Number one, is he going to ask Joe Canning to come out of retirement? Number two, should he? And uh, number three is the idea of Canning as a selector, um, a runner. Because, look, let's be let's be honest here. Let's call a spade a spade. Henry Shefflin has not managed at this level. So he's a novice in that sense. I think we both feel straight up that he's completely qualified to do it and probably will be a success. But you can't ignore the fact that he hasn't done it at this level, nor has Richie O'Neill. So they are coming in here, not road tested at this level. You know, that, that's all fair to say. I think we'd have to accept that. So then he probably will want to get some someone with experience at this level in there and obviously someone who knows the um, knows the lie of the land in Galway. So could you see a Joe Canning coming in as player? I think not. I think I think because Canning has had so many injuries, he's talked about that himself and the, the toll it's had in his body. So I think he himself would say no. And I think... Because you've got a forward line with Mannion, Cahill Mannion, um, Connor Whelan, and Brian Kincannon, and maybe you know, you'll have Evan Nyland taking the freeze. I think the the pace and movement. I think that's the way Shefflin is going to go next year. Well, it's going to be fascinating, and whether we ever find out, we will find we will find out because we're just going to have to persistently ask. You know what? We, like, what's Shefflin's thinking on it? Will he make a call to Canning? Will he go and meet with Canning? Um, like essentially as well you have the best player of all time probably talking to one of 
the other best players of all time, asking him potentially to come back and play another year. Now, I, I don't see it happening. I cannot, I can't see, I don't see Cannon coming back into the fold. I think he's, I think he's drawn a line on it now. And even the fact that he was injured for Portumna in recent weeks and missed, missed a lot of their games, I'd say his, his mind is made up. We even had him, uh, we had him on the throw in there a few weeks back and we just asked him, was there any chance of a U-turn at any stage? And we're not talking about, you know, been asked in October to come back training in January, we're talking even about coming back in April or May. And he just said, geez, no, 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 that's it now. If people knew me kind of personally, I'm stubborn enough. If I say something, that's it. That's the way it is. There's no return for me, I'm afraid. That's the way it is. Um, do I see him coming in as a selector? Uh, I don't. I don't at this stage of the day. I think um, Shefflin will surround himself with uh, a bit more experience. Guys, someone like I, I don't like using names out of turn, but someone like Gavin Keary has coached at inter county level with Clare already, you know, and he's involved, I think, with Loch Ray this year. I think those are the sort of guys Kevin Lally maybe hasn't coached at county level, to the best of my knowledge, but he's been involved with a Thomas's team that have went on, you know, loads of All-Ireland club runs. And these guys will know the, the club scene, you know, fairly intimately. So th those are the sort of guys and potentially, and maybe it's unlikely, but maybe maybe someone who was involved with, with Michal Dunne, who's um, uh, All-Ireland winning backroom team, maybe there could offer, could offer an awful lot to them as well. Do I see Cannon coming back? It's like, you know, the king and the prince. But I don't see it. I just, I just don't see it. I think, I think Canning has his mind made up. Yeah, I agree that uh, on that front. But I wouldn't be shocked if he was part of the backroom team because number one, I think if you see your phone light up with Henry Shefflin's name, assuming that he has his number, I mean, I don't know, maybe he doesn't. And Imagine it was just like Henry and the Crown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Remember when Shefflin left the WhatsApp group with. Um, Kilkenny didn't Richie Hogan put up um put up a screenshot of the WhatsApp group the king has left yeah, yeah that's right, right yeah right. but I think if Henry Shefflin did pick up the phone and just say Joe would you be part of the backroom team the wider backroom team selector I'm not quite sure I think that would be something that would be very hard to say no to and because there's such an excitement level around this appointment and from Henry's point of view like uh, like I'm sure they've chatted away at functions or whatever, like some media briefings and stuff like that, and all that stuff in 2012, you know, in terms of like after the draw in All Ireland when Joe said it was a bit unsporting in terms of just going up to the referee and all this kind of stuff, which is water under the bridge, and it was completely overblown. But I'm sure all of that is com is not a factor. I I don't I can see that happening. I can see him being part of the backroom team. It's only a couple of years ago that Kieran Donaghy was part of the backroom team for the Galway hurlers. So why not somebody who's you know, been there and done it both at club and county level. Why not? Yeah, maybe. I just, I think, I think the type of person Joe is, I'd say he will cut the card and he will cut it fairly definitively. But as you say, if the question is asked, you know, okay, I, hypothetically, I'd say this is how it will go. If, if, if I was to put my head in the block, I'd say Henry will ask him to come back to play and Joe will say no. And then he might ask him, would he be involved in the backroom team? That's pro that's potentially how I see it going. Or would you have a think about it? But this is all fascinating stuff. Like, like uh, you'd love to be, like, geez, you'd love to be a fly in the wall for that conversation wh whenever it happens. Like, do you know what I mean? Do you, th do you think it will happen, though, that conversation? I, I actually think, at first I was like, I don't think he'll ask him to come back and play. But then I was thinking, if he wants him to come back as selector and he feels that Joe himself won't come back, it might actually kind of plumas him or bring him on side a little bit if he kind of at least acknowledges like how excellent a player he has been for Galway by saying, ah, can we get you back? And, you know, that might plumas a little bit before then moving on to the next part of the conversation. Is, what about being part of the backroom team? Do like what, um, what uh, Shane O'Brien did with Brendan Murta. Not saying this is actually what he did, but Brendan Murta was brought in as part of the backroom team. Obviously, he was a coach and then ended up play, playing later on in the year. Um, it's going to be fascinating. There's also a distinct possibility that that conversation will not happen and yeah. that Henry, who retired in 2014 and felt it was the right time, would recognise that Joe retired the end of July this year, feeling it was the right time and will not ask him back. Um, will there be, whether, whether like, to think that there'd be no conversation at all between the two would be surprising though, even if it was something to do with the backroom or that. But 
if I, I, I don't think, if I was to say right now, I don't think Joe, I honestly think Joe Canning will be no part of the Galway South in 2022. You've called all. it. Yeah. You've called it. Jackie Tyrrell actually said on RT Radio, I think last night, to be very greedy about it. I'm disappointed in this decision. That's just the self, as a selfish Kilkenny man. I know that if he were in the Kilkenny dressing room, the presence would, uh, you know the presence that that would carry. But uh, he understands, obviously, like he sees the merit of it. He obviously is back in Henry to do quite well there. Um, so, yeah, I wonder is the average Kilkenny fan in any way perturbed by this? Keep your comments coming in. They're flying in at the moment. We'll get to as many as we can. James 6500 says, Well, lads, do you think with GA managers, you are more respected winning an All Ireland at club or county level? Who would you have more respect for? E.g., Shefflin winning two at uh, Ballyhale or one in Galway? What would be more respected? I would guess. I would guess the inter-county one, but I think anyone who's got to that level understands that winning one a club is a massive achievement. In many ways, depending on who you win it with, it's as big, if not bigger, an achievement to do it with a club. Yeah, no, a cl- club all Ireland is huge, all right. Um, but, you know, winning all Ireland with your county or winning it with another county would be absolutely massive. Uh, funnily enough, who was the last outside manager to win an all Ireland? I think, do you, do you have to go all the way back to Michael Bond still? I think you could well have to. Um, I'm actually fairly sure. You throw in Cody's 11, Liam Sheedy's 2, Davies 1, Don Logrady, Lo John Allen, Nicky, Nicky English. I actually think you have to go all the way back to Michael Bond. And then you look at it as what's seen as a success in Galway, winning on All-Ireland, realistically. And when you look at the, the talent pool that they have, you mentioned, you know, Dottie Burke could potentially still be coming into his prime. Conor Whelan ha- probably hasn't hit his prime yet. Same with Brian Kincannon, Parik Mannion, Cahill Mannion, to name but a few. And then five All-Ireland minor winning teams over the last seven years. You'd have to say, and, uh, you know, Eddie Brennan and even Taggy Ford, they've said it in recent hours, that... Henry is smart with where he goes. Like in fairness, he knew there was talent in Ballyhale, and he extracted the best out of that talent. He knows there's talent in Thomastown. They've already won a league title, and he'd be hoping to win a county title. But does he know that there's talent in Galway? He does, and it's very, very obvious that there's talent in Galway. And in fairness, yeah. Shane O'Neill won't get any credit if if Henry wins an All Ireland, but he probably won't. But he has blooded a lot of new guys, like given Evan Evan Island more time um different Darren guys Morrissey. Darren Morrissey these guys have been blooded probably really properly under Shane O'Neill he'd probably be the forgotten man much like Parik Fanning is the forgotten man in Waterford for debuting the likes of Prunty and Caleb Lyons and these but Shefflin has some talent pool to pick from yeah I I think like they like they have to be challenging for an All-Ireland next year and I think at a minimum have to win the Leinster Championship because player for player they should they should have been beating Kilkenny the last couple of years. And even like playing sweepers at times, I couldn't understand. And the non-performance against uh, Dublin in the Leinster semi-final when they missed so many chances and put up just 114 was very, very poor. You, you've, you're talking about the outside managers there, and I can't help but bring up the list of managers who are going to be involved in the championship in 2022. Obviously, Antrim aren't going to be there because they got relegated and, and Lee stayed up in their stead. But I'm just going to count them out now. There's going to be 11 teams playing next year. Let's see how many are outside managers, or, or sorry, inside managers out of 11. So Kieran Kingston with Cork is one. Brian Lohan, Dublin, Matty Kenny, no. Uh, Galway, Brian, or <laughs> Galway, Henry Shefflin, no. Kilkenny, Brian Cody, yes. Cheddar Plunkett with Leash, yes. Kylie, yes. Tipperary, Bonner, yes. Waterford, Liam Cahill, Wexford, Darren Egan. So that's only six out of the 11 teams are managed by native managers. Uh, is there something in that? Is, there, is, is that interesting? Like, are we sort of... Is this kind of how it ever was that the likes of Kilkenny, Cork, Tips stay with inside managers and the rest are happy to, to kind of just look for whoever across the country is the best man for the job? Yeah, it's a funny one. Um, the t- real traditional powerhouses have never gone outside mm. um, and will likely never go outside. If you look at it, Galway's four All-Irelands, are, the four of them are you know, provided by Galway men. Cyril Farrell with three, Michal Dunahu with one. They probably had a failed experiment with, with Gerlach Nan in there. Um, and you'd have to say a failed experiment under Shane O'Neill, but they've gone back outside again. Um, and I think they had to this time because uh, just I think the vast majority of Gala people, their number one was Dunahoo. And when they couldn't get Dunahoo, it probably had to be someone big. It had to be something bold. 
and this is this is as bold as you get. In fairness, he couldn't get any bolder. Oh, it's so good. You could talk about this all day, couldn't you? Yeah, it's just I, I'm fascinated by like I'd love to be in Brian Cody's head right now. I'd love to be. Um, and I wonder, I wonder, did did Shefflin have any contact with Cody? Probably not. Um, uh, about going for this job or but it's just it's fascinating because they're definitely going to meet next year at least once, potentially twice, potentially three times, maybe if they were to meet in an All Ireland final. And you'd have to wonder, like, I put I'll put it this way. Who is more likely to win an All-Ireland in the next two years? Henry Shefflin with Galway or Brian Cody with Kilkenny? By God, that's some question. I'd say, yeah, you're putting a gun to my head. I'm going to say Shefflin with Galway. Players on that team have won an All-Ireland more recently. There's there's a core of guys. So obviously we won't see Canning next year. We may we may not see the likes of Davey Burke, whose game time has obviously been limited. Will he be in, reinvigorated under Shefflin? Will he find a role for him that works? Uh, he's definitely been tried in a couple of positions in the last year or two, and you know it hasn't really happened for him. Um, of that Kilkenny panel, I mean, obviously they, they've gone six years now without winning the All-Ireland. There aren't too many left that have won All-Irelands. Porrick Walsh is one that jumps to mind. Killian Buckley who hasn't had you know, too much game time in the last little while. Owen Murphy has a few. So you'd say in terms of like the talent coming through in the last year or two, even though they haven't made good on it just yet, and players who've already been there and you know done that at all Ireland level and won the title, yeah, it's, it's sort of leaning towards Galway, all right? I'd, um, I'd be of that opinion as well, I have to say. It'd be interesting if we did the power rankings again. Would Galway shoot up just as a result of a, of a managerial appointment, which is another interesting one. Well, we were going to do that with Tip, weren't we? Yeah, yeah, possibly so. So, um, as you say, Galway won All Ireland only four years ago. Outside of Canning, who you know nearly immediately announced his retirement, nobody else has announced their retirement since. Um, who knows? Maybe there will be certain players that Shefflin thinks are surplus to a requirement and they could end up sailing away into the sunset. I, I don't know. But I tell you what was interesting, a couple of things about Shefflin's managerial career so far. Um, how he managed Michael Fenley at club level, I think was really, really interesting because he could train you know, a minimal amount and he still had him captain of his team and he was rock solid centre back and rarely exposed, even though he was probably able to do very little of the training in comparison to others. And I remember him saying, uh, I remember him saying around Colin Fenley, it could have been that he was, you know, caught a couple of times with training or something like that and couldn't go. And it was no issue. And he was no issue with giving lads time off or managing people. And I think uh, TJ Reid said about them going doing yoga and things before, which is not, you know, maybe not something you'd tr traditionally associate with Kilkenny teams uh, down through the years. So I, I definitely think he, he will bring a lot of that kind of modern kind of approach to it. Tactically, I think it's going to be fascinating. I do see them playing a traditional enough style because I think Galway have the physical players that can play the sort of style that Kilkenny played back in the day. They have physical players, they have ball players, but they also have a load of mobility. I don't think he'll go and try and tactically bamboozle you know, Paul Kinnerk and Limerick. I think he'll try and beat them doing what he thinks will serve probably the way he likes Hurling to be played and the way Galway are best playing as well. Yeah, I can see Concanon and Whelan playing as a two-man inside line. I can see Cahill Mannion being told to float from centre forward. I can see Parik Mannion going back and having that central role around centre back. Obviously, I don't think he was at 100% this year. Dahi Burke, then Lorden at a full back. Dar Darren Morrissey probably doing the other job beside him. Ah, it's, it's mouth water, and I have to say, do you know what? You'd also assume now that Shefflin isn't going to be involved in the Sunday game next year, and you oh, know, well, lads yeah, are getting a nice yeah. bit of bunts for that. So I, I hope the, uh, the the expenses for driving up to Galway are pretty good. I'm yeah. sure they are. Joe Butler, a Kilkenny man, says, uh, "What con I'm sure you're a Kilkenny man. What constitutes a success uh, at this level for Galway? All Ireland final win. I I think getting to an All Ireland final. I mean, if they meet Limerick in an All Ireland semi final, I think pushing." Like the road to an All Ireland will be through Limerick next year, and if they meet Limerick along the way and lose narrowly and have won a Leinster title, I think people will say fair enough for year one. But anything less than that, I just I don't think that's going to cut it. I'd be I'd agree with you. A Leinster final win in year one and getting to the last four would be I think that would be enough in year one. Now they could easily exceed those expectations 
you never know, especially if he, if he gets if they get on a bit of a roll and get things right. But I'd say winning Leinster, winning Leinster would be would be a big one. Um, and to do that, to imagine they're probably going to end up meeting Kilkenny. Yeah, there's some amount of comments flying in, lads. Keep them coming. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. It's over 9,000 now, but how sweet will it look when it says 10,000 subscribers on YouTube? So keep that going. Interesting, Shefflin said he'd never manage against his own. Why well, he went to Thomastown to not manage against Ballyhale, obviously intermediate against uh, senior there. So he didn't have to worry about that. Albeit, you know, as you've kind of already pointed out, they're going to be in an intermediate semi final against Glenmore next week. Will it bother him managing against the likes of uh, Owen Cody next year? Because that is going to happen. And he's going to have to instruct the likes of, let's say it's Darren Morrissey if he's fully recovered from injury. Hey, go out there and sew it into Owen Cody. <laughs> yeah, it really is. That's just the, that's just the way it is. Because um, he's now the danger man. Like, to me, Owen Cody is now the marquee forward of Pugani. Uh Yeah, I'd, I'd nearly agree with you. I think he is, I said it to you before, I think he's the potential to be an absolute monster. Physically, he's turned into a monster as well. Um, but that that's the way it is. Uh, people are misconstruing the the Bally Hale thing for not wanting to manage against your own in Kilkenny. He, in fairness, he never said that. He just yeah, he, he, it was actually really interesting. He was out for a round of golf with Brian O'Driscoll as part of an off the ball thing, and he was like totally taken aback when it was said about man, manage against Bally Hale. Like totally taken aback. Just like, no, 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 no. Couldn't couldn't do it or whatever. But um, he's he's obviously going to be in a similar position. It's just going to be with Galway now. Obviously, he's going to be managed against. TJ, Joey Holden, if he if he's still there next year, Owen Cody and a few others that and I'd imagine they were on the back of this year's campaign and how well Ballyhead are going and how well the likes of Joey Cody and a few others are going, that there could be even more Ballyhead players in there. Um uh, that Adrian Mullen as well. Um so it's gonna be, yeah, it's gonna be fascinating. It's yet another, you know, fascinating part of this. I just can't wait to see that handshake with Cody whenever it happens. Uh but Cody's first media rea- media interaction this year is going to be fascinating. What he says about Cody, oh, you know, look at her. What he says about Shefflin, you know, that's going to be fascinating as well. Like, yeah, it definitely will. Um, there's a good comment here from Mark Corker, and I don't think this can be de- disagree- uh, anyone can disagree with this. The only thing Henry will text Joe Canning is there's only one king, Owen Kelly. <laughs> Well, I mean, I don't think any of us can argue with that, can we? Yeah. <laughs> hey, is, there, is there a better, like, I don't know if this nickname known across the country, but like in Tipperary, Owen Kelly is referred to as the son of God. Is that known across the country? Yeah, I actually, I would have heard that before, but it was only when you put up the um, the picture with the four separate, if you had someone to take a goal scoring chance, who would it be? And someone replied, it could only be one, son of God. And obviously, he's the son of God in hurling terms. And... Uh, Peter Canavan is the you know, son of God, and then Dara, Dara Canavan is referred to as you know son of son of God. Now at this stage, but uh, you know that would be well that would be well known in fairness uh, in most circles. Um, but yeah, it's it's hard. I, I I've never been buzzing as much about something that I don't have a direct interest in. You know, I don't have a I've no Galway allegiances apart from being born in Ballinasloe. I don't have any allegiances to Galway, and you'd be absolutely buzzing over this. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure they're still talking about you in the hospital there. In, in <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Ugly baby. <laughs> Limerick drive for five. Will Shefflin change these classy hurlers who wouldn't go into a dark room for you? Oh, that's fighting talk from Limerick. I mean, don't forget that Galway pushed you to three points. They were in a puck of, of a ball there in the 2020 semi final. I think he will bring that hard edge to Galway next year. Uh, I don't know, just because of how he played it himself and all the teams he's been on, and even what he did with Bally Hale the last year or two. I think he knows that you need men to play at this level, lads who are willing to, you know, front up and, and sew it into the opposition. So I, that's what I'd expect. I mean, Galway were hard edged there for 10 years. It's the last couple of seasons haven't gone their way, but they won in all Ireland. They were in finals, semi finals. What makes you think that these lads are anyway soft? Yeah, no, I, I'd, I'd agree. Um, any element of inconsistency or you know flakiness that we would have talked about with Galway is not something that like not something you associate with this team. This is the first year where there's been inconsistencies. I would say in a long, long time. And as regards what type of principles will Henry instill? To me, forget about everything he could do with the ball. To me, Shefflin's greatest attribute was his tackling ability and his ability to be an absolute pest as a forward and just disrupt defenders, turn over ball, get in lads' face. I actually ended up watching yesterday. It's it's comical. It's only about 14-second clip on YouTube. But uh, it's when Kilkenny played Clare in the league in 2014 and uh, down in Cusick Park. And 
he put he goes to tackle Brendan Bogler, my own club manager at the moment, actually. <laughs> yeah, 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 and yeah. and the referee blows it. And uh Shefflin's going absolutely mad. He starts doing this this dance as if to say that Bogler is kind of like swimming, like what we'd say sometimes about party matter, but it's absolutely comical. Yeah. And the commentary <laughs> off it makes it even better. Uh, Kilken- Kilkenny Alice says uh, I'm a Kilkenny fan think it's great to see Chef take go a job give it a few years yeah see a few more ex-Kilkenny hurlers take on roles with Chef and Eddie and Fenley uh, obviously Eddie Brennan has managed against Brian Cody already there was that league game last year so uh, he knows the feeling I- I've asked him about it before you can find it on the R game playlist Andrew Sullivan if Cannon gets the call to go back he will have to have a right think about it he has a chance to play under one of the greatest hurlers ever and if they go on to win it he will regret it that's a very fair point and also Adrian Mullen there a couple of years ago, he was in a situation where he was being managed at senior level by Brian Cody, under 20 level by DJ Carey, and then club level by Henry Shefflin. So that man knows what it's like to play under all the greats. Yeah, it doesn't get much better than that. He will, Joe will have to have a think about it, but I think his mind is made already. I, I, again, he'd it, love to be a fly in the wall when it was announced, what, what did he think? Um, but it's going to be an interesting, really going to be really an interesting uh, close season. See when Shefflin does his first kind of media engagements as well, or his first interview. Uh, I'd imagine it wouldn't be for a while somehow, because there's an awful lot to get sorted with Thomas Town first. I'm sure there's a lot of stuff to go on behind the scenes and settling together on his backroom team and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, Joe Butler, a, a cat to the core, living in Mayo for nearly forty years. Yeah, you never forget where you came from. Jerry Brown, think it's a bad appointment for Galway. Still think Shefflin is unproven at the top level, and for a team expected to challenge for the top honor. I mean, that is true. He'll kind of have to learn on the job to some degree. It's one thing managing a club situation where, you know, the level of backroom team, the amount of delegation required, it is required. Like, uh, you know, a team that goes all the way to the All-Ireland as, you know, we, we both, you know, I'm not trying to say we're great lads, like, but having both been there, we see the amount that's required in terms of like planning, strategy, uh, delegation. He's done that at club level and done it really, really well. And I think the best club teams they're like a light version of a county team. So I think he's somewhat road tested, but I think Jerry makes a, a somewhat of a decent point there. He, it might take a little bit of an adjustment period. No, it will. And what's interesting as well is, is that, like, he, fair enough, he had, he had nothing left to prove with Ballyhale, but he did leave because of fatigue, I'd say, was, was a lot of it at the end of two years. Whereas you'd probably say, um, and some would say, like, it take, would taking a good bit of time and energy to get Ballyhale on the straight and narrow, but an inter-county job is more demanding. An inter-county job is full on. That is full on. There is no off switch really with it. With five so, hours commute per evening. Yeah. Uh, see, the thing about that is, well, uh, I know Anthony Daly was very good with it and a few others have been down through the years to get stuff done on that commute. To almost, you know, leave an hour's work for the commute and be ringing people and getting things sorted along the way. So again, listen, he's going to have to be uh, very very good with his time but I remember I've been down with uh, with Joe Hartman the physical therapist a few times and Shefflin he said he's seen Shefflin at 6 in the morning in Druid's Glen and these places if he's trying to fit in a treatment before work this is the, that's the type of individual he is he just will find a way he'll find time to get everything done uh, and he's going to have to be really economical with his time now when he takes over Galway yeah uh, Grode Howley Shefflin will develop new players I reckon I'm trying to remember is it David Kilcommons is that the name of the pace he's sort of half forward he's a player that I think might uh, we might see a little bit I, apologies if I got the name wrong you know you're trying to remember all these things off the top of your head Alan Gilfoyle Shefflin playing a modern style with Thomastown this year yeah intermediate club level trying to take uh, Thomastown onto the next level they've lost the last few intermediate finals can he take him on to the next level and the question is does he see out the season or does he need to get to they're not playing this weekend. The Galway quarterfinals are on, so I'd imagine he'll travel down for that. The following weekend, I'd imagine there's a break for Gaelic football, so he'll be able to take over Thomas's town. But, like, you know, we saw Colin Bonner leave the uh, the Dixborough backroom team as soon as he got the job with Tipperary. So there's always the outside chance that Shefflin... Will... Well, I don't see Shefflin abandoning Thomas Town mid-season, no matter what. Um, like, it's only a semi-final and a final. Now, maybe there would be a Leinster run after that at Intermediate if they do get through it. But I'd imagine he will see it out. Uh, an interesting comment in here from Will. The other thing is that the Shefflin Challenge could reinvigorate Cody and also the Kilkenny panel. We are not letting that shower get the better of us. It is interesting because, like, I think that that will motivate Tipperary no end when they meet in Walsh Park in the Munster Championship next summer. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd agree with you. And I, I don't know if that's something Brian Cody will say. 
Uh, I don't know if that's... But it'll be, le- you know, it'll be understood throughout the past. Yeah, it will be understood. And it will definitely be something that's going on in the back of his head. Uh, interesting comment there from a viewer about Johnny Glynn. You know, mm. John- Johnny Glynn is would be a perfect Shefflin player. Johnny Glynn, I'm not saying, like, just thinking about, you know, a Martin Comerford or a John Hine or someone like that, who is, you know, a brilliant, you know, primary ball winner. Getting someone like that back will be, will be huge as well. I, I tell you what, I think Canning returning would be a bonus and Glynn returning would be a bonus. And I think he will explore those avenues. But I think he's, he'd still be very happy with what he has anyway. Yeah, I, I don't see... I think he'd like to have Johnny Glynn in there, but I don't think he'd build a forward line around him. I still think it would be those two boys on the inside that I mentioned, Whelan and Kincannon, with Mannion allowed to float and do a bit of damage. Like, I see Kyle Mannion as a bit of, like, Richie Hogan at his peak. That's what he could do if the team was winning ball elsewhere around the field, that Kyle Mannion would be a nightmare for oppositions. Because he also has deceptive pace to solo straight up the middle, draw a man, which that Kilkenny team did for years, Shefflin, and likes Owen Larkin being the main ones to do it. Solo up the centre, hand it off, wheel and put that in the back of the neck, good lad. Someone like Johnny Glynn would be an, an excellent foil for all those lads, though, and would do the donkey work that's mm. needed to make life an awful lot easier for them. So that's going to be another interesting one, too. Yeah. Sean O'Sullivan, who done me last week with that comment, Brian Cody is a lover. Read this Ireland. slowly now. Just read this really slowly to make sure... <laughs> so, somebody right. actually tried to do me already. <laughs> it was like, uh, you know, there was a there was a little expletive in there if I read two words together quickly. I was nearly caught, but uh, no, I, I'm actually proofreading a bit better now. But Sean says, Brian Cody is a lover of hurling first and Kilkenny second. His grace from Waterford finally won in 2017, was top class, that was a quarterfinal. In a way, he was almost happy about it, that hurling as a game had progressed. Yeah, no, I didn't. Brian is a hurling man, first and foremost, in, fair, in fairness to him. And he's always, he's very gracious in victory or defeat, in fairness to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What if Galway flop again next year? Will that taint Shefflin's reputation towards maybe managing Kilkenny in the future? Um, possibly, yeah. Well, it also depends on how Michael Fenley goes. Obviously, Eddie Brennan will be in the conversation. Maybe even Dave, David Herity, who's done some good stuff too. Yeah, no, it, it will, of course. It, like, I, I don't listen. I don't think he, he can be judged just on Galway because uh, he does have a bit of credit in the bank. But, like, you know, a flop would be what they did this year. That would be a disaster. Um, you know, winning Len- winning Leinster and maybe not getting to an All Ireland final in two years, something like that. Don't think that would be a flop, uh, but it probably wouldn't. We expect such big things, don't we? We have really high expectations, and it's natural because um, the expectation that's it's a direct consequence of how good he was on the pitch and how quickly uh, he's already seemed to settle into club management. We just have these massive expectations for him. Uh, somewhere between our expectations and reality is probably about right. And that's, the, to me, like, that's just say in three years with Galway, that's Henry Shefflin winning two to three Leinster titles, getting to probably two to three All Ireland semi finals and getting to an All Ireland final. They might not necessarily win an All Ireland final. He could still have a very good reign. His, like, he's going there to win an All Ireland. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. he will see anything short of that as a failure, which means we might as well look at it the same way. But Pow Pow has come in flying here. Galway wouldn't beat Snow off a rope in a hot kitchen. Gone soft. <laughs> look, they've been poor, but I, I don't agree with that. No, uh, before before the before the championship this year, like me and you were both rating them number two. Fair enough, they've slipped well down the pecking order based on what we saw this year. But the potential is huge. So, like, what are we saying here? Galway have massive potential and they need someone to steer them along the right path. Michal who had them along the right path uh, and they've probably veered away from it a bit. They need someone to get them on the right path. Mm. Fair enough, he's an inter-county novice uh, in management terms, but he was fairly able to get Ballyhale back on the right path. Now, he had the knowledge of everything that goes on in Ballyhale and what he needed to do. He's going to have to get you know that intimate knowledge of Galway hurling and get inside the psyches of Galway players to get the best out of them. But I wouldn't be a bit surprised if he did. Mark Corcoran has come in with Colin Fennelly. Obviously, he'd have to return. He took out the intercounty season last year to play out his last few years in the Galway colours. Nice little <laughs> Arsenal-like transfer. Don't quite see it happening, but it's an interesting one. 
Let me just see. There was a couple of more good comments in here. And uh, let me see. It's the Shefflin show, isn't it? Like, and it has to be. Yeah. It's the only We're show. We're going to talk club, but like, Galway yeah. people didn't want Davy because he wasn't long term. I mean, this is the line being trotted out. How exactly is Shefflin a long term manager either? Asked Joe Murray. I mean, you can see. You could see two years, like he did two years with uh, Ballyhale, other than losing maybe a group game, which, you know, I said to him, you have a 100% record. You've won every game with Ballyhale after they won Leinster in 2019. He was quick to correct me and say, oh, well, we lost the group game because he obviously just wanted to get rid of that narrative. But like he stayed with two years with, with his own team who were based locally with a five hour commute. Two years would be some going like that's a massive commitment even just to do two years. Yeah, and he actually said, and obviously his statement was very, very short within the Galway GA statement, but he said he was looking forward to working with players, board and uh, spectators and fans over the, ne- over the coming years or over the next number of years, I think it was. So it's obviously, there was no, uh, it wasn't released whether it was a one year, two year, three year, but you know, I'd imagine he's not coming in for, you know, a wham bam, thank you, ma'am, that he's committed to two years minimum. Yeah, Paul Young, Galway don't look don't work hard enough when they don't have the ball. Something Henry was great at. And Greg Hoban says, imagine Gal- Kilkenny versus Galway all Ireland final. I think that would be I mean, in a way, we'd all love to see that, wouldn't we? At the very minimum, give us give us that in a Leinster final. Yeah. What based on our power rankings, a Galway Kilkenny final is a mile away. But you never know. Uh, a snap power rankings now for, for next year in Leinster only. <laughs> Leinster only. Look, the monster teams, yeah. Okay, but uh, we might do another power rankings down the line. But are we now, we're both saying Galway won, yeah? For uh, Leinster? No. For Leinster next year? No, it's, it's still have, it's still, I still have Kilkenny number one. It's Galway number one, lad. Okay, I still have Kilkenny number one. Going for, going for three in a row. Pri- tried and tested, road tested. Yeah, they are back-to-back Leinster winners. Um, I put Kilkenny number two. I put Dublin number three. Uh, Wexford number four, then Leash and then Westmead. Yeah, I, I'd flip. I'd flip Galway and Kilkenny. I'd have Kilkenny one, Galway two, Dublin three, Wexford four. Uh, what was the next one? Leash uh, five and West Me- Westmead six. Yeah. And uh, next year, Shefflin is also potentially depending on how the league goes or how the All Ireland series goes. Assuming that both Galway and Tipperary get pretty far. He could be up against his former club manager, Colin Bonner, and together they won an All Ireland club in 2015, wasn't it? So that would be another interesting uh, battle. Yeah, uh, I don't. I actually not 100 percent sure where Offaly come into the Division One equation, but he could come up against Michael Fenley at some stage as well. Oh Jesus, let me check yeah. that out. I'm you actually not. There. Yeah, I'm actually not 100 percent certain uh, if Offaly are going into One A or One B next year. Because there was talk- here. Yeah, there was against talking- it. It's going to be Fenley against Sheffield next year. They're both in Division 1A. There you go. There you go. Uh, that's the stuff we want, isn't it? <laughs> now, there's, there's so many little subplots here. Like, it's it's gas, like. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we, we'll move on from this in a minute. We'll talk about a club. But just a few more comments. Henry was looking, uh, was long enough playing, looking, managing against Galway at county and club level. He'll be well aware of the type of player he's dealing with. Get a backroom team with good knowledge of underage. Very fair point. Mark Corcoran, awfully mindset is unreal. Wait for it to win <laughs> Leinster next year. Do you care to answer that? No, I just, uh, I tell you what, Shefflin and Galway have all the potential haven't delivered on it the last two years. Sorry, Galway haven't. Shefflin wasn't there, obviously. Kilkenny have delivered on what they have the last two years. I'd, yeah, I'd still have them. I, I, that's not to say, I, I think probably uh, odds-wise, Galway are probably favourites to win Leinster. At the moment, who would I tip to win Leinster? It'd probably be Kilkenny. Yeah, yeah. Will, uh, will this be good for Galway players as it takes the limelight off them and onto Henry, giving players breathing room? Interested. That, like, that's an, like, so just to give an NFL thing, uh, again, so the uh, Jacksonville Jaguars finished last in the NFL last year. They drafted like the most talked about quarterback of all time. Like, so you've all heard of, you know, Joe Namath and Tom Brady and all this. So this lad coming out of college, he was considered, he's he is considered the next it guy, like the big guy. So what they did is they drafted him in. But then what they did is they drafted in this other guy who used to be their quarter, a quarterback years ago uh, under their new coach at college level, Tim Tebow. A guy who you like, he's just a star for a couple of years and then he just went to went to pot. But they brought him in, not as a quarterback, but like as a tight end who would be like in hurling terms the center forward. And it just completely changed the narrative and took all the pressure off them. Now they've started the season terribly. 
<laughs> don't get me wrong. I thought so you were like, going to justify <laughs> this, like. <laughs> yeah, but they're they are pretty poor, like, and it's going to take them a while to get good. You don't just go from not to sixty. But it might be one of those things. And even if you brought back Joe, I mean, there's zero pressure on anybody else. And maybe, but in some ways, like one of the best Kilkenny or Galway performances I've seen in the past few years is when they didn't have Joe Canning. So other players had to step up in that Nolan Park game against yeah. Kilkenny in 2019. So maybe in a way, in terms of like knowing that the Joe safety net isn't there, maybe some other players will step up because they know, well, we can't just constantly rely on him. Well, they have been braced for this for a couple of seasons now. Mm. And in fairness, that's why I think Shane O'Neill will get credit in time because he has helped along that transition. Not not playing Joe in every league game, starting Evan Island on freeze, um, giving him the responsibility at different stages, coming on in the last couple of minutes of that all Ireland semi final to hit a big to hit a big free. Uh, I think that transition has been sped up in re- in recent years. Yeah, yeah, I, I'd agree with you there. Another comment in here, obviously this is a reference to the fact that you've got Stockholm Syndrome for Kilkenny. Mikey Kitty Cat Verney. <laughs> Kitty Cat! <laughs> That's your buddy. <laughs> Limit Drive for five, Hugh Garst from Limerick Leader. Oh, no, I pronounced it wrong, so I didn't get caught there. Yeah, Jamie Mack. I pronounced <laughs> it wrong, so I got away <laughs> with it there. They you are, can read those, they are can read those first two you. words quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I nearly got caught there by Limerick Drive for five, but uh, they I, are I, coming I, for you left, right, and center. You're gonna have yeah. to. You're gonna have to have someone vetting these comments very, very carefully. Yeah, this this is unfair. Now I take this as an attack at this stage, but um, I'm not sure if that story about Aaron Galan is true or not. <laughs> I'm actually gonna have to look it up at this stage. You have me. You have me mitered altogether. So is it time to... Oh, wait, now, Sean O'Sullivan, he's after throwing in a question here. Could you do a thing during championship where you put bets on matches no more than a five or a game split up, man in a match, top score, etc., and play off again each other, uh, winning uh, goes to charity at the end of the year? Um, anything, anything, it up, Sean. anything to do with charity or something like that, I'd gladly, gladly do it, yeah. Be a bit of crack as well. Wow, Shane, that one had absolutely nowhere. I presume that's the NFL thing there. Uh, Henry will have a great edge in Kilkenny as he knows the key players so well. They're all Ballyhale. How can he plan to down those guys? Unbelievable, you know? Yeah. A bye, Bernie, bye. Kilkenny, number one. Best thing that came out of Galway is the road to Dublin. They're out to get you, Shane. Says Shane, Kilkenny. I just, it's like, it's almost like, you know, Moe's Tavern now at this stage. Do you know what I mean? There's just going to be peop- different people and there's going to be different pseudonyms and different names. Um, yeah. But I think that's I think that's enough of the Henry hour now. Uh, can't wait for it. It's going to be interesting, but so much other stuff to get through too. Yeah. Do you know what? Special Congress is going to go on this weekend. And I talked to Nicky Brennan, former GA president, former Leinster chairman. Check that out on the playlist there on our game. But I saw a good tweet from Conor McKenna, who's a journalist, and he goes, one point that hasn't been mentioned in Proposal B. Now, this is the one where the provinces are played at the start of the year. Then it's a league-based system. The top five from Division 1, they get through to the quarterfinals. Then there's sort of the top teams of Division 2 and playoffs with the Division 3 and 4 winners to, in preliminary quarterfinals. But uh, Connor makes a good point. One point that hasn't been mentioned in Proposal B is how it will impact hurling coverage. There will be 16 football championship games every week and it will overlap with prime hurling season. It's not physically possible for media outlets to cover every match. And you know what? Because, because of the, like streaming obviously takes a nice bit of money because you've got, number one, the commentator, you've got maybe an analyst beside him, a co-commentator, you've got somebody videoing it, and then you've got somebody who's uh, like kind of, I don't know, the video mixer as well. So you've got a lot of people to pay. And if you wanted to stream these to counties across the board, there's 16 games going. Is there enough people in each county? Obviously, there'd be two counties covered with every game. Is there actually enough people willing to pay for all of this? Because it's not cheap. No, no, it's definitely not cheap. And I know I heard, I heard Nikki talking about that yesterday. It is a costly exercise, in fairness. Um, Connor makes a very valid point. But the only thing I'll say on that is, is that and I love hurling. I love hurling an awful lot more than I love football. And I'd love if hurling was on the telly every day. But the football championship, it's it's so imbalanced, the coverage. The provincial games outside of a couple in Leinster, or in Ulster, I should say, they were totally meaningless. So you didn't need to have games on early in the year. At least now, yes, it will affect hurling coverage. And that's not good, but there's nothing we can do about that. We're going to have, I, I think anyway, a far more interesting and balanced football championship where you've a load like there's going to be 16 games every week in the football championship if proposal b comes through and a lot of the time you're not going to be able to call 16 games you know you could confidently call two or three of them so that means we're going to have really exciting football weekends 
and really exciting hurling weekends. Yes, there will be maybe a shortfall of hurling games within that, but we're going to have, rather than having, you know, one exciting championship, the hurling championship, we should have two. That's the hope anyway. Yeah. And I mean, I think in most sports, there are always going to be those terrible games every week. The problem was for years with the knockout provincial championship systems, you could have like the first week of the championship was New York versus Mayo, you know, a game that nobody has any interest in. Then the next week, it might be Antrim versus Fermanagh, the only game which outside of those two counties, you know, no insult to those counties, not too many people beyond their counties are that interested in the game. So it was a real damn squib feeling. Then ultimately, three months later, you might get to a few interesting games. At least this way, even if there isn't everything in the line in the first first few days out, you know, Dublin will be playing Kerry, Tyrone will be playing Mayo, whatever. Yeah. There are going to be good games. Even if not everything's on the line, there will be good games every single week. But uh, that's just one to keep an eye on. And it does get that, it does all of a sudden feel like maybe this proposal B might actually pass. And I don't think it's perfect, but I would rather do that now and amend that again going forward. I'm not sure if five teams getting through from the top division and you know the sixth, seventh, and eighth best teams in the country don't get through to knockouts, but the 24th best team might. Yeah, no, I'd agree with you. I definitely think there's faults with it, but I think it's a lot better than what we have. Mm. And I don't buy the provincial council argument. Listen, okay, the, the provincial championships are going to be played earlier in the year. I don't buy that they're of much less importance. Like, is the Leinster Championship of any great importance at the moment? Being, being honest, I, I don't really think it is. Uh, but if it's been played earlier on in the year, teams are still going to want to win whatever competitions they're in. You know, uh, and the, all the great teams, Dublin under Gavin, uh, Kilkenny under Cody, particularly in the noughties, and you know, Limerick under Kylie now, they will want to win everything. So if it's a, you know, all the great teams want to win, regardless of competitions, when they're played or like that, they want to win every time there's a trophy up for grabs. So I don't believe that the provincial championships will be downgraded that much or degraded that much. Mm. We're going to talk about the Clare Saffron and Blue plan. I might get you to read it out. I'll just get a couple of comments going while you tee that up. David Corcoran, nice shirt staple, really taking the Hank Scorpio impression to the next level. I don't <laughs> intend on it, but obviously it is working out that way. Uh, Shane, what is this? What is the GAA fascina fascination for NFL coming from? Jackie Tyrrell had to get Sky in. It's almost a cornerbacks thing. What is the story there? Is it the tactics game or what? There is an element of it. I do like the tactics thing. I do have a certain fascination for the amount of stats they use and the, the insight and all that kind of stuff. But I actually think it's just the amount of spectacular action. Like when a ball is thrown up between two lads who are such finely tuned athletes like these athletes are just on another level compared with what we're seeing in amateur sports and like the massive hits the massive plays i i don't know i think it's just that it's just a really spectacular visually spectacular sport yeah i don't with i danger, don't with danger yeah. involved oh yeah danger um <laughs> which always makes it more interesting because you don't know what's going to happen but uh as you said they are serious athletes i don't i don't watch them myself i watch red zone a couple of times uh, to be honest with you, I don't have the time, I don't think, to, to dedicate to it. Uh, but it is, tactically, it's fascinating. And I do think we could learn an awful lot from how they promote it, uh, their stats-wise, you know. If someone gets a goal, like if, if Joe Canning scores a goal, why can't it come up on the screen, 39th championship goal or whatever? It is. Like, there's no, there's no reason we can't help ourselves in that way in the GA. So I do think there's a lot we can learn from from these other sports. Yeah, Um Sean O'Sullivan says I'm more of a Mo Sislak with the phone calls. Uh, Mo, Mo Sislak before the um before the stage fell down in his face. Remember he used to be uh, they did an episode and he was actually a really good looking fella and then he had to <laughs> yeah, the oak ended up falling on him. <laughs> yeah, Elf uh, El Flakador 09, ice hockey is well worth to watch too. I actually went and saw an NHL um game in 2009 in Toronto. The Maple Leafs were playing against whoever, who cares? But I found the Toronto fans to be terrible because their team were rubbish. And no, they've more recently won um, a Stanley Cup, I think. But they, they started booing the team, booing the team, booing the team. They were like 3-0 down. Then they scored and they started cheering like mad. And then they conceded again. They started booing like mad. And I was like, this couldn't be less GEA if you try. 
It's basically like Homer Simpson and the isotopes. You know, he was like, yeah, isotopes, isotopes rule. And then someone said the isotopes last, and he's like, boo, isotopes. <laughs> you know, that's the way it is. But just onto that Claire Saffron and Blue plan, because it might have flown under the radar a small bit. So this is Claire GA's five-year plan. I believe it was put together by uh, an independent body. So it was a wide-ranging review of Claire GA, and I'll just go through some of the, the main things on it. Uh, one of, it was circulated to clubs, I believe, last night, and I believe it pulls no punches, describes the county centre of excellence at Cahar Lawn as not fit for purpose and claims the administrative structure in Clare is not reflective of a vastly changed operational environment. So just going down through a few more of it here, uh, regarding the centre of excellence, it says the focus is for Cahar Lawn to provide excellent training facilities for all teams of both codes, existing facilities lack the most basic training infrastructure that is needed to prepare a team. What is built is not fit for purpose. Grass pitches are unplayable for large portions of the year. Dressing rooms are too small. It takes two of the existing dressing rooms to accommodate either of the senior panels. The gym is too small. At 130 metres squared, it can't accommodate a full panel. The non-training aspects, including meeting rooms, catering, video analysis, etc., can probably be greatly improved. The whole site is completely underdeveloped with gravel roads, no landscaping or tree planting. Now, that's a fairly uh, damning indictment of what's supposed to be a centre of a centre of excellence. And just going down here to it a bit more, it just says that 42% of the Clare GA public and Clare GA club members rated governance as the priority area for attention within the plan. So that's what um, two of every five people think that there may be an issue with governance within the county. And it just says that today, uh, in its assessment of Clare GA government structures, the SPG uh, document states that th those to date have been largely based on a traditional approach to managing operations. They are not reflective of vastly changed operational environment. This operational shift is now uh, manifestly evident in how the business of sport functions, financial requirements, games development focus, and the facility required to operate a tier one GA county. So that's fairly hard hitting stuff. Like it's essentially, um, it's saying that the center of excellence is not fit for purpose and is essentially a wreck. And it's saying that the county board uh, and how they operate and do their business is not been done prudently in the modern era. And that's the anecdotal evidence that me and you are getting from Claire people on the ground. But to see it, you know, there in print is uh, fairly startling to see what happens now as a result of those findings will be really interesting. Yeah, you're basically saying that Brian Lohan and all the, the other managers at the different levels are operating with one hand tied behind their back and that the chances of, like, Clare aren't being given the best possible chance to win an All-Ireland title. So Limerick have obviously turned things around massively, a lockdown to volunteers, but obviously there's been money pumped in there too. And look at what's happening now and the conveyor belt will continue to churn out really good players. Some counties are really at the forefront of this, and it's no surprise then when they do so well. So for Clare to kick on to the next level, this needs to be sorted and quickly. And it is really, a, it's shining a light on the people who have um, overseen what's, you know, what the money that has been spent in Caherlone in the last few years. Because, you know, I mean, you talk to people anecdotally from Clare, and they've been hugely frustrated about this for years, and how the money's been spent and who's done what and all that kind of stuff, which, of course... You know, because of the defamation laws in Ireland, which are unbelievably punitive, it's the North Korea of the world around here. You're not going to say too much about the people that are supposed to be, um, you know, at fault here, if you want to look at it that way. But really and truly, it just makes you wonder, number one, where could Clare be at right now if things were done well? And how many other teams are kind of under this same sort of, um, or counties are being held back this way? Because they're multi-million euro uh, businesses, all of them, and in general, in a lot of cases, the wrong people are are kind of holding the reins. Well, a lot of that is saying now is yeah, there's so much money. You talk to any county secretary now, uh, volunteer or paid, they will say about the crazy amount of money that is passing through their hands essentially in order to run their you know in order to run their county's activities. So like, if you don't have people with fairly serious business acumen to run a business. The business is going to fail. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like if you were running a business, uh, if you were running a business and you don't run it prudently, you're going to go bankrupt. That that's just the way it is. And I'm not saying Clare are going bankrupt or anything like that, but definitely their investment in Catalon, you'd have to say the money invested, they are not getting any dividends from it. And they're I God only knows how much money is needed 
to bring it up to standard based on what this kind of independent uh, review has said. And then a lot of that would probably come back to personnel and people involved at, at board level. So recommendations have been made here. But unless, you know, unless there's a personnel or new personnel brought in maybe to help the current personnel that are there, you don't envisage that changing because it's a pure mentality and a culture change, really. Yeah, it's true. Uh, pure Hatchet says, would a live podcast be in the pipeline? Well, we're live at the moment, so can you specify what you mean exactly, Pure Hatchet? And like what time, what time of the week are we talking about, what a cover and what? Just be interested to know what you mean there. Um, let's see, Patrick Higgy said, it's shining light on people who have not done what's right for Claire GAA. So it'll be interesting to see where that goes, but there, there's an awful lot in that. Um, let's move just, on to the, just on that chain quickly. Yeah, I remember saying we uh, I said I was chatting to Donald Maloney not too long ago that he was the former giant manager of Clare with Jerry O'Connor from 17 to 19. And he basically said, Clare don't have you know problems with their senior teams in the short term, it's the medium term that they have the problem with. It's that they there could potentially be a lost generation of players if they're not careful. Now they're trying to arrest that, but if young players and even senior players if they can't see that what uh you know what's going on in the county is to a really high level and then you hear about everything that's going on in limerick and elsewhere you can get demoralized and a bit disillusioned as well so i'm not sure it's going to take probably quite a lot financially and it's going to take a lot of new personnel i would say helping out to turn this around but there is no reason why it can't be turned around i i saw it excuse me in my own county we were all over the place two years ago. I have no, no issue in saying that whatsoever because they know what was going on and things have turned around remarkably quickly. So there's no reason why that can't happen in Clare or anywhere else. And I'm not saying we're perfect. We're, we're, not, we're far from perfect and we're always improving. But um, Clare, there's definitely significant improvements needed. Yeah. So just a reminder, we are brought to you by Torpy Bamboo. Get 10% off with the Torpy Bamboo using the promo code RGAME. Uh, I see somebody had commented saying that the promo code didn't work, and I double-checked. It should be working. Uh, I always put it up with the single inverted commas either side. So just use the word RGAME, and that should work to get 10% off there. Uh, please do subscribe to the channel. Bottom right-hand corner, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to all the other channels as well. Look to get it over that 10,000. The more that view... The more that subscribe, the more that uh, YouTube recommends it to other people. That's how the algorithm works. And also, you'll be able to get the audio podcast at patreon.com forward slash our game. Five a month and a great way to support the channel. The YouTube, is it not called? The YouTube. YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Google. Uh, <laughs> the Derry Senior Hurling Final is on this weekend. Schlock Neil have held the title for many a moon at this stage. Do we give Kevin Lynch's any chance of uh, turning them over in this one? Yeah, now I, I have to admit, I don't, I, I haven't been following it unbelievably closely, but Kevin Lynch's are back in the final, haven't got there last year. I think Big Jeffrey McGonigal was over them last year, not involved in this year to the best of my knowledge, but Schlock Neil gave them a fair trim in last year's final. It was yeah, 20, 20, points, yeah. yeah, it was 23 points to 11, like, you know, scoring 11 points in, in a county final. Always difficult when you're trying to take uh, a team of Schlock Neil's stature off their perch and just going down through. The Schlock, Schlock Neil team there. You're just looking at obviously um Carmel Codotterty would be one of our best known players, Brendan Rogers as well, who I think was in with the footballers this year, wasn't he? Um Chrissy McCaig, you'd have two. They'd be all kind of household names. Um they're going to be very, very hard beaten. Like, and there's no point in saying any different. Schlock Neil, I'm sure, are looking beyond Derry, because that's just the nature of it. When you become a dominant force, the more than Valley Gunner in Waterford you start looking outside of your county and they'd probably be eyeing, they would have been eyeing from a while out the Antrim champions whenever they meet them in Ulster. Uh, again, I don't have an intimate knowledge of what's been going on in recent weeks and how good Kevin Lynch's are going, but very, very hard to go against Schlock Neil. And, you know, you'd imagine that they have a scratch to itch about getting to an All-Ireland Club final. Uh, haven't been close close enough in recent years. They gave yourselves a good game in the semi final. They gave Bally Hale a cracking game in the semi final as well. So I'd imagine their you know their sole aim is to get back around that stage again. Yeah, and they haven't won the title since 2011 when they beat Lavi. They've lost the last two finals in 2019. It was that bit closer, 123 to 212. So I mean that's 26 points to, eight, uh, to 18, which is you know still eight points. But they're definitely struggling to get scores against Schlock Neil. So 11 this past season and then 14 
and you convert the goals into points or the yeah so i mean that's that's their challenge there can they get enough scores schlock neil are very good obviously won three of the last four ulcers too they'll be um hugely tipped to win this one and it is very hard to go against them what about the limerick final this weekend uh you forget that there's such a classic game coming up here kilmalik against patrick's well a battle of two clear managers with john o'mara over six mile bridge or of six mile bridge against tony considine who's over patrick's well yeah and i believe this is tony considine's uh second spell with kilmalik he trained them early uh, in the last decade i think when they won a couple of t- couple of titles and i think he I think he was, I can't forget whether he was manager when they got to the All Ireland Club final. I'm actually not sure, but he came back. He's after coming back. I think he came back last year. So you know, when someone it doesn't, you don't hear of that too often, actually, at club level, uh, about another a manager coming back. Well, in fairness, Padre Whelan did it with us, but I wouldn't have heard of it too much. A lads coming back to a club, they generally just keep to keep looking on and look look elsewhere. But uh, that's going. It's going to be an intriguing final, and to be honest, like not one you would have predicted. Because Kilmanic weren't going particularly well. No. Uh, they were beaten handsomely by Napierce at the start of the championship. They scraped over South Liberties after extra time. And I said this in one of the shows recently. If you looked at those quarterfinals when uh, the Wells scraped over Adair, scoring the last five points to beat them, I think they were, uh, was, it, was it 18 15 going into injury time and they won 2018. Kilmanic scraped over South Liberties. And then you, you're not thinking that both are going to produce. Big enough, not upsets, but Dune and uh, the Piercing would have been favoured to prevail in two semi finals, and the two of them produced massive, massive performances. So, yeah, it's a fairly finely balanced final, I have to say. And going down through the teams, if you go down through that Kilmallock team, there's a wealth of experience there, probably more experience, I'd say, uh, from their elder statesmen than on the well side. You've Graham Mulcahy, obviously, who's still going with Limerick, Gavin O'Mahony. Uh, Paddy O'Brien, then they've Aaron Costello and Robbie Hanley, who will be in with Limerick as well, and if uh, Barry Hennessy in goals, and Oshin O'Reilly, who was on the Limerick panel in 2018, and then going down through the, the well, like she, I'm sure you go through it here now. The spine is phenomenal, really. Yeah, Brian Murray, former All Star goalkeeper, Dermot Burns at centre back, Keen Lynch, whether he's centre forward or in or around midfield or jumping between the two, Aaron Glan in the forward line. Forward line. Kevin O'Brien's obviously an excellent player. Jason Glan has really stepped up in this championship. They've got a lot of class. I think there's a couple of positions where they're probably a little bit ropey and can be got at. Whether Kilmallock can do it, who were in their first final since 2017, is the next thing. Oshin O'Reilly, who we've mentioned already, he scored 2 4 the last day, man of the match in that semi final win over Dune. And I'm wondering, is he sort of um, making John Kiley think, well, maybe what, what can this guy offer next year? But it certainly has the makings of a very, very tasty Limerick final. I think it's going to be on TG Cahar as well, isn't it? Yeah, it is indeed. We didn't actually mention um, Michal Houlihan as well with Kilmallock. Jerome O'Connell was on earlier on the year, uh, basically singing his praises as well. So he's another guy that would be maybe trying to kind of burst his way into the mix. Into the mix, And uh, it's funny, Patrick's well have four All-Stars on their team. And like outside of... Brian Murray, Keane, uh, Keane Lynch, Derma Burns, and Aaron Gillan. Outside of maybe Ballyhale Shamrocks, just there's not too many more club teams that are going to have four All Stars playing on their team. Uh, offhand, other teams that are playing now that are still in the Championship. Again, outside of Ballyhale, who'd have Fenley, Reid, and uh, Joey Holden. And I could be wrong. Have they got a fourth All Star playing at the moment? They have a young herder of the year in Adrian Mullen, but I don't know if they have a fourth All Star and another young herder of the year. In Owen Cody, but I don't know. I can't think of too many teams that have four All Stars playing, and um, one of our viewers might correct me. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Get your comments in uh, if you if you've got the answer to that. Pure Hatchet actually clarifies his idea of a live podcast, live in front of an audience, i.e., people in attendance. Yeah, so um, we'd certainly be on for that. The, like, if there's a clamor for that, please let us know. We'd certainly like to do it at clubs, even as a fundraiser, as I was suggesting earlier in the year. Absolutely open to that. I think it'd be great crack, sort of. You know, build up whatever games are coming. Maybe even next summer, Hunters County games uh, could be huge. But um, yeah, we're absolutely interested in doing that. It, like the 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 scutter that sometimes we come out with online here, and some of the stuff we say. Imagine some of the stories, the more X-rated stories that you ca- you can't put out on the record. That would be uh, ideal for a live show. <laughs> yeah. So uh, look, if you're interested in doing that, or if you're involved at your club and you think that doing a club uh, fundraiser of a live or a game show in your club would be the way to go. We're absolutely willing to work with you to do that. So uh, email events at our game.ie. Certainly beyond for that. Kilkenny semi-final. Hey, call, call the Limerick final. 
Oh, sorry. Um, I'm going to go with Patrick as well. And you know what? I'd like to see them take a tilt at Munster this year. My guess at the moment is Killadangan are going to win the Tipperary Championship. And I'd love to see the likes of those two get, you know, how would they go in the Munster Championship this coming year? It's such a shame that Killadangan didn't get a go at Munster last year because it was, things were um, curtailed due to COVID. I'd go with the, with the well also. And I'd imagine that now they're after getting back to this stage, uh, they limped out a Munster last time, didn't they? They were disappointing when uh, when they won a couple of years ago. So I'd imagine they'd love another crack at. But uh, I expect that to be very tight, I have to say. Kilmarnock mm. have a lot of nous when they get back to the, that stage. And again, going through some of the players I said there, they have an awful lot of experience too. Yeah, he hates his live audi- audience sounds class. Yeah, absolutely. We're totally willing to do it. So we'll get a bit of a clamour going for that and, and build up to it. John Crawford, no outside manager since Sparrow with uh, Kilmallock. Patrick's well to win the final. We'll move on to... So you are, you're also going for Patrick's well? Yeah, and just on that, yeah, it was the Sparrow Lachlan was over Kilmallock when they got to the final. He took over from Tony Constantine either that year or the year before. Um, yeah. But they were uh, poor in the All Ireland final that year, weren't they? They were, yeah, they were, and they haven't they haven't won a county since that year. So that might have taken uh, that might have knocked the stuffing out of them a bit. Yeah, it was just a lot of wides from from poor angles, and then eventually Bally Hale broke them down that year. Paddy O'Loughlin gone this year too. That is big blows from Limerick Drive for five. Kilkenny semi finals this weekend. I suppose I'll tee us up with um, a little clip from from um, our man uh, Nicky Brennan. So I was asking him about James Stevens and uh, Bally Hale, who meet in the semi-final. These are massive rival, rivals from over the years. So let's hear what Nicky had to say. Now, they have been playing their game so far this year without Adrian Mullen. And Darren Mullen was only back the last day. So, But they seem to be, they're certainly getting back to the type of form that won them those club championships. They're playing very well. Now, they're playing James Stevens on Sunday. And James Stevens. In my view, would have beaten them last year had they brought on had James Stevens brought on Owen Larkin. I think they would have. I think it was the game was crying out for an Owen Larkin and his experience. Now, as it happens, he uh, came on as a sub for James Stevens in their uh, Shield final against Mullinavat recently. I was at the game, so at least he's in their plans for the uh, for the championship on Sunday. He won't be a starter. Ironically, who's not in their plans is Jackie Tyrrell, and I saw him playing with their second team last Sunday, and he gave an exhibition at centre half back. So um, maybe maybe there'll be a phone call to Jackie before now on the weekend. But James Stevens will go into Sunday's game. And I spoke to their manager, Seamus O'Dwyer, last Sunday. They will be full of confidence. James Stevens will always feel they have a chance again uh, against Shamrock's Valley Hale. They don't feel overawed by the occasion. And I actually give them a good chance. I think they're in with a right good chance of winning it. They may have only won their, uh, their um, semi or their quarter final by the skin of their teeth with what was really a, a goal scored by a corner back who came down the field, Shane O'Donnell, and put it into the back of the net and Dixborough had no time to recover. But nevertheless, there was little bit little between the two teams in that game, to be quite honest about it. But James Stevens have, uh, will go into Sunday's game not in any way overawed by the occasion and feeling they're in with a very good chance. I give them a really good chance on Sunday. If you enjoy yeah, and um, would would you be feeling similarly? By the way, we've a comment in clarifying to call them Shamrocks of Ballyhale that uh, we've been told before, and so did uh, Nicky Brennan clarified again yesterday. Oh, I don't like it. How how do you change something that's already ingrained in your head like that? Like, it, well, we call it the Aviva Stadium now instead of Lansdowne Road. So. No, I didn't. No, I'm not some corporate shill. I call it the Lansdowne Road. You're definitely Lansdown a corporate Road. shill. I am definitely not. To? Unless there's some sort of a brown envelope coming into a letterbox, I'm definitely not. Well, <laughs> there I'm saying, you're a corporate chill, <laughs> you'll take the money. Um, let's see, uh, Bally Hale against James Stevens. Do you think there's more of a chance of Bally Hale being caught in the semi final by either than by either of Tullerone and O'Loughlin's? So, James Stevens, like, could James Stevens have, should they have beaten him last year? They did all the hurling to beat him, um, and I'm sure uh, it's not a game that Niall Brazen would look back fondly on. I think he had a about seven or eight wides from the middle of the field he got on so he could have been man of the match he could have won the game by himself and it was just unfortunate uh he just left uh he just left the shooting boots at home that day unfortunately and they should have uh they could have easily won that game and they were the better team to be honest with you it wasn't a snap and grab or uh, smash and grab or anything from bally hale far from it but they got goals at a crucial time and retija linking up with colin fenley for a brilliant goal but uh, nicky is right um, James Steve, there's no, you know, maybe it's tradition or whatever it is, I don't know, but there would definitely be no fear 
from the village for Ballyhale. They won't be overawed by, you know, them being back to back All Ireland champions and what are they going for now? They must be going for four Kilkenny titles in a row, I'd say. Um they were pro- they were blown away by them in the final in nineteen, but they showed what they could do last year. They've a load if this isn't a village team that we know particularly well. There's a lot of kind of new guys that maybe wouldn't be household names. Niall Braz is probably not a household name. Connor Brown has obviously played a bit with Kilkenny. He's back in the fray. Yeah. Uh, if he's fit, I'd imagine he, I'd imagine he'd start. But like Keane Kenny wouldn't be a household name, but he probably will be in a couple of years because he's an absolutely brilliant talent. Owen Gilfoyle, uh, Matt Root, obviously, who would have played for Kilkenny back in the day. And then you have Tygo Dwyer. Dwyer. Then you have an experienced player like Owen Larkin coming in off the bench uh, maybe for the last 10 or 15 minutes. They've definitely developed a new team. They're... A smaller uh, size profile team, but they use the ball really, really well. Real mobile team. They'll fancy their chances of taking a good cut off them. They really will. The only worry is is that from a Bally, from a, a village point of view, Ballyhale do look to be coming right again when it mat- when it matters most. And I have to say, I do, I do agree with you. If the if Ballyhale are going to be beaten, it's in the semi final because I I don't I can't see them being beaten in the final. But either the other two semi finals, with due respect to them. Yeah, but I just wonder, like, because James Stevens obviously had to move on from the period where they were completely backboned by Owen Larkin and Jackie Tyrrell. Now, Jackie's with the second team, as Nicky just explained there, and he'd be one interested to see if he'd get the call up based on how well he's going there. Larkin's back in. <clears throat> we probably all saw that catch he had the last day towards the end of the game against Dixborough. He's still that threat in the air. And you, whether you want to put him in half forward line, whether you want to put him full forward line, he still has had that threat there. But well, in 2019, when they got to the county final and they lost 221 to, two, uh, to 115, no, that's a sizable enough beating there. Maybe the transition wasn't, wasn't totally complete at that stage. And then you jump forward just a year to last year. I mean, that, that semi-final match they had was, was incredible. And I'd say James Stevens are still kicking themselves over 322 to 126. Didn't, didn't Connor Brown have a chance to get a ball in an attack and half of the field and pick the ball up off the ground directly? Mm. And, was a free the other way. So they've showed that they very quickly went from being fairly pasted in the county final with a changed team to last year going really close. And now you've got Niall Brazel and he's centre back, Luke Scanlon in his midfield. These are guys who are, you know, getting towards the county panel and they've taken them from probably being corner forward type players to building their spine around them. So they've obviously just been really evolving in the last couple of years. So it makes it very interesting. No, definitely. I'm, I'll never forget, like, Cheddar been absolutely crestfallen after that match last year. He looked like, you know, you know, it was a death in the family nearly because they had left it, but they had left it, but they delivered. They couldn't have done much more and somehow managed to lose the game just down to Ballyhale's brilliance, really. But, like, again, from a worrying uh, thing for the village is it's just like <sighs> Ballyhale seem to have more new players coming now. Like Adrian Mullen didn't play the last day. Uh, Darren did play. I don't think Paddy was playing the last day. Adrian Mullen, whether he's fit or not, is going to be interesting for the weekend. But Joey Cuddy coming in uh, has you know lit it up in attack. They obviously still have TJ. They still have Colin Fenley. Uh, they still have uh, Brian Cody. They still have Owen Cody. Dara Corker in defence. Joey Holden's always going to be solid at fullback. Richie Reid is still there. Dean Mason and goals like. When you look at the matchups, I, I tell you, there'll, there'll only be one team that would be really worried about the matchups, and that'll be the village trying to, you know, cross their T's and dot their I's. And a lot will have to go right for them again. But I do give them a fair, I do give them a fair shout. I have to say now. Yeah, ML eighty nine says James Stevens could be the only team in Ireland able to beat Bally Hill, but don't think they'd win a club All Ireland even if they do. It's an I think that's point. a really, I think that's a really interesting point, and um, and I wouldn't dis, I wouldn't necessarily disagree. Um, that could be like if they do go on a run now, this could they could look back at this as the hardest game they've gotten all year. Um, yeah. and it's the yeah, it's a real, real dangerous one for them. Ballyhay will get better the longer they play together. They're only just coming to the boil now, so to me, opportunity does knock for the village again. Yeah, Timmy says for the week that's in it, Ballyhale have to beat the village. Ballyhale didn't turn up against them last year, seven points at least. And uh, Joe Butler adds, Ballyhale have tightened up their defence in the last two games and a multitude of players to score. I mean, that is true. Obviously, he meant to tie two games, but don't worry, I, I got what you meant there. It's hard to go against Ballyhale to win this game, but I do expect it to be two pucks of the ball in it at most. Yeah, I'd say one. I'd say one puck. Um, I'd say one puck. Uh do you know what? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go for the village to win it. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. No, it was massively impressive what I saw last year. 
and they've had a few, you know, I think beating Dixborough by a point can be looked at, you know, one of two ways. It can be looked at, oh, they scraped over a quarter final, maybe against a team that weren't going particularly well. But I think when you look at it with the localised angle, that's a City Derby game and all bets are off. It was just a matter of getting through that game. And, mm. uh, you know, Keen Kenny was brilliant. I think he hit five from play that day. Matt Root looks like he's back on form as well. They've got plenty that could do damage up front. The the big thing that killed him in last year's semi-final was, was Colin Fenley went to town early in the game. And while the village got ahead and ploughed ahead and, uh, you know, were ahead to the final stages, they actually left themselves with a lot to do at the start. And were, ch- were you know, fair enough, they overhauled the lead. But maybe then they were flagging at the end of a game as a result of having to put in a big shift to overhaul that lead. If they're more consistent over the hour, I give them yeah, I give them a right shout. Yeah, listen, um, I, maybe our power rankings will be totally different, and the team that we were potentially going to rank one could be out when we chat on Monday afternoon. Yeah, and I think people will forgive us given the Sheffield thing happening that we're again going to postpone the club power rankings for <laughs> next week. We do want to do, it, but you know, sometimes a story breaks. And uh, what are you going to do? Want to do that club power rankings justice as well? Like that, t- that's going to take time. Well, we don't, bit. But when you say that, you mean we don't want to make fools of ourselves by picking teams that are going to get knocked out at the weekend. <laughs> there is that fear too. Please do subscribe to the channel, bottom right hand corner. Click subscribe. Uh, trying to get the YouTube over 10,000 people. Obviously, follow all the other social channels too. If you want the audio podcast and you want to support the channel, five euro a month, uh, patreon.com forward slash our game. Great way to be able to listen to the podcast while you're going around for a walk and you don't want to have YouTube open up on your phone. So it makes it that bit handier. Now, we'll uh, jump on to Tullerone against the Lachlan Gales. To go from intermediate champions just a couple of years ago to winning a county title at the uh, in the autumn of Tommy Walsh's career, that'd be something else. His brother, Porrick Walsh, would be a huge reason if it does happen. And Shane Walsh, too. He's an excellent player. Mossy Keown driving the team from the half forward line. But O'Loughlin Gales, who I would have in the past said, you know, they were that, that very good team, combative team. Then so many skillful, nippy players in the forward. I wonder how they had a size profile. Now Paddy Deegan's in the forward line, winning ball and throwing it over the bar. It's a bit of an unknown quantity, this semi-final. Hard to know how it'll go. It is a bit like if you look at it in recent years for O'Loughlin's, it's been Hugh Lawler, a fullback, Paddy Deegan at centre-back. Now you have Hugh Lawler at centre-back where he's dominating games, I believe. And Paddy Deegan's playing the full forward line and often operating at corner forward. And he doesn't strike me as a natural corner forward, but he's definitely doing the business for them. And they still have you know, the likes of Mark Bergen and Owen Wall chipping in and attack. Guys that have been there for a while, particularly Mark Bergen. Like he's been around the block a long time and is still producing the goods at club level. Um, obviously, Andy Comerford is over them. Uh, you know, one of, one of their own. They're coming up against a taller own side. Yet, yeah, Martin Walsh is an, yet another Walsh uh, brother. And then you have, obviously, uh, the other Tommy Walsh in defence as well. And Mossy Keown. So, like, Tuller own have a fair backbone too. And they've been consistently good all year. And Auckland's have come kind of with this run and have timed it probably right. Um, someone said to me, and it just I know it was an interesting point, Tullerone have a great chance of getting to a final if they don't like overthink it too much. Almost. They've nearly... In, in, sometimes in a parish like that, it can actually mean too much to you. And you can want it too much and overthink it a bit. And that could have been you know, one of the reasons and the pressure of it all, why it took them longer than it probably should have to win that intermediate. But, like, by Jesus, they have settled in into the senior ranks now. And this is... These opportunities don't come around every year. They've, to me, they've avoided the two big hitters in the semi-finals, and they've a monster shot at getting to a county final. Yeah, so if you want any more thoughts on the uh, Kilkenny semi-finals, the Nicky Brennan interview is there. He talks about all the games coming up. He talks about JJ Delaney getting it done with Fenians. He scored 1-2 at the weekend. So he does all the previews there, including talking about Brian Cody's son, Dermot Cody, playing full-back for James Stevens this weekend. Maybe picking up um, the uh, Colin Fenley, who obviously isn't lining out for Cody at the moment. So there's a lot going on there, isn't there? Imagine that. Imagine that. Said something. Imagine Dermot Cody said something to uh, said something to Colin about not playing for Kilkenny or something like that. You might jump on to the, to the Galway quarterfinal, Shane. Yeah, absolutely. So there's some really tasty games coming this weekend. Like the shock of the year was seen with Kilnadim and Leitrim being knocked out by Turlock Moore, who were finalists last year. Don't think too many people saw that happen, especially when Turlock Moore went 10 points ahead. Dahi Burke got his second yellow card. 
Um, for a foul on Colm Loy, I think, who went very, very well in this game. So the semi quarterfinals, I should say, this weekend are Tommy Larkins against Claren Bridge, St. Thomas is against Kilkenny, Capitagal are up against Gort, and Crockwell are against Kilnadima Leitrim, as I said already. Just to reflect on Claren Bridge, they had a great win last weekend up against Tommy Larkins, who will be run, uh, their forward line will be run by Jason Flynn this weekend, and he's putting up scores. And there was a clip going around that the, their club shared recently of a beautiful sideline cut from him, must have been 60 yards out. But that was, um, you know, that, that'll be a tasty game this weekend. And um, so Claren Bridge had the 110 to 17 win over Loch Ray last weekend in horrific conditions. And I think there was a lot of frees even been missed by uh, Evan Island of Claren Bridge, which is really unlike him. So I, th- I actually think that's a very hard game to call Tommy Larkins against Claren Bridge. Very tough, yeah. Um, a lot will come down to their two kind of ace marksmen, I'd say. Jason Flynn going up against Evan, Neil- Evan Island on the place balls. Um, there was a clip going around there a few weeks ago. I know you saw the, uh, Jason Flynn playing this yeah, absolute, saying, a yeah. beautiful sideline cut that looked like it was going about 15 yards right or wide on the left-hand side, and he just curled it back in beautifully. I, I do say, right, if you take Thomas out, I was only chatting to Cyril Farrell the other day about this, it's almost like the Leinster Championship. If you take Thomas's or you take Dublin out of it, look at the championship you have in front of you. Like It's very, it's very, very hard to call. Thomas's are the obvious one here. Um, you, you, you think on paper, and given what they've done in Galway in recent years, that they look head and shoulders above the rest. But what an opportunity for Tommy Larkins, Claren Bridge, these teams, to get into a county semi-final. And if you avoid Thomas's potentially to get to a county final. So I couldn't confidently call that one, to be honest with you. Thomas is against uh, Kilkenair, and I think they were the, the intermediate champions was the last year and came through the senior B route. Um, very hard to see anything other than a Thomas's win, but Kilkenyron have, yeah, yeah, Kil have done, pieces. yeah, Kilkenyron have done great to even get this far. Uh, they beat uh, Parik Pierce's and beat them fairly well in the preliminary quarter final, beat them by seven points. And they've lots of pace and lots of energy, but uh, Thomas's just have too much, uh, too much nous, too much experience, and too much class, I think, as well. Yeah, uh, let's see. So we'll move on to the Cork semi-finals. Um, are we touch on any other game there? Cockwell against Kilnadim Elitrim. You'd imagine Cockwell will come through there. Capitagal, who've been a regular semi-finalist up against Gort, who did Gort win it about six years ago at this stage? I must look that up as, a, as I throw that to you. Uh, Gort played in the All-Ireland Club semi-final in 2012, I think. I think Coolberry... They won in 2014, actually. Yeah, yeah. They won it, they, they've won it since as well, yeah. Um, I'm sure Aidan Hart is still going strong with them. His future with Galway will be interesting as well. He's had probably a good bit of injury trouble in the last couple of years. Interesting to see whether he'll be re-energised with, with Shefflin coming in there as well. Uh, tough one to call there. Capitagal are, are you know, on farm in recent years and having come out with that tough group with Thomas's are probably, you'd probably nearly rate them as the second best team in Galway at the moment. So, and Gord would probably be rated as nearly the third best team in Galway. So you have two and three coming out there. So again, for the likes of Crockwell, Kinnadim and Leitrim, like, there's a massive opportunity there. There's a potential carrot of getting to a county final if if you can avoid if you avoid Thomas's. Um, so it'll be interesting to see who takes their opportunity there. Just a quick one, Shane. Just going on on awfully. Uh, the last last stage of group games are this Sunday. They're all at four o'clock, all five, and it's really uh, evenly poised going into it. So Rhinos are on top of the table, as I said to you before. It's two groups of five. But you don't play the teams in your group. You play the teams in the other group. So which means you have five group games and there's no idle weekend. And then the two tables are merged, basically. So Rhinos are top and they're definitely true to the semi-finals. Only four teams true. They're on eight points. Then you have Kuleri on six, Kilcormack on six. You'd imagine the two of those are safe. Um, they're, Kuleri are playing Sir Kieran at the weekend who are on zero points. Kilcormack are playing Drum Cullen as well who are on zero points. So both would be fancy to get through. But it's a real... Real interesting behind that. We're playing Rhinus this weekend. We're on four points. Uh, Balnamere are on four points. They're playing Belmont also on four points. Kennedy on four points. They're playing Shinron on four points. So the CCC and Offaly who devised this structure couldn't have dreamed up a better scenario where there is literally something on the line in every game. So we play Rhinus, which is repeated at 2019 final where they beat us by a point and they beat us in last year's semi-final. If we win... 
we have a fair chance of going through, albeit it will be on score difference. From Marina's point of view, what if they have to play for? They have a chance of knocking their great rivals out of the championship, which teams love, which teams love to do. So that's an interesting game. Uh, Kulderi are on six. Not one. I think they're nearly as good as a short on score difference, but Kulderi and Sir Kieran is a local rivalry, and that's going to be really interesting. Kilcormick and Drumcullen is probably the one game uh, not of massive interest, and you would be expecting Kilcormick to win. But Balnamir and Belmont and Kennedy and Chinron, like they could go either way. If either team were to win and by a decent amount, you could potentially get that fourth spot. And as you know as well as anybody, like we haven't been playing particularly well. But if we win this weekend and book our place in semi finals, all bets are off. And I'm sure Balnamir, Belmont, Kennedy and Chinron will be saying the same thing. So it's a dream scenario for drama at the end. And it's you will need it's the sort of thing where people are going to be on their phones, checking Twitter, checking updates. What's the score here? What's the score there? So it's going to be fascinating. Yeah, I really do like that system. Uh, you know, when you kind of make the elevator pitch, it doesn't sound great. But the more you delve into it, you know, it's, it's got something to it. Dan Delaney says, give the Leash Semi some airtime. We will come to that shortly. Uh, ML89 says, could be a big year for Clarenbridge. Big statement win. Have been threatening for a few years with underage success. I think they've won five of the last seven minors. Thomas's winning uh, margin in knockout in Galway has to be one or two points the last few years. They just know how to win. We'll they have been to... tight games. They have been. Yeah. They've gotten over some really tight games. And funnily enough, that's been a problem outside of Galway. They haven't been able to win tight games and haven't performed. But within Galway, they seem to have the... I don't know if it's a, a mental thing or what, but they seem to have it over teams when it comes down to that kind of white line fever kind of a time at the end of a game. I wonder, would we rate Thomas's in the top 10 teams in Ireland? We, like, assuming that they continue on and, and they're not knocked out before we do the power rankings, they'll have to be in the top 10 by virtue of the fact that we know they're going to get to an All-Ireland semi-final. But if they had to go through a province, I wonder, would we then also be keeping them in the top 10 teams in Ireland? Yeah, interesting, yeah. Um, because you, you have to have them in it because you know, as you say, you're not going to be in an All-Ireland semi-final. And they've been there uh, several times. But if they had to go through Leinster or... Munster, or even if they had to go through Ulster, it would be very, very interesting. All right, I still think they'd probably squeeze in. Yeah, yeah, probably just about because they have a lot of class there. The Cork semi finals are on, sorry, Cork quarter finals are on this weekend. Uh, by virtue of the group, uh, their performance in the group stages, Sarsfields they have a buy into the semi finals. So there are only three quarter finals, which are Douglas against Black Rock, Aaron's own against Middleton, and Glen Rovers, they're up against Immokilly, also in a relegation final. Carrick Tuhill are up against Charleville. So the Douglas against Black Rock one is of particular interest. I mean, I don't think they have too many dual players operating at the moment, but uh, Douglas are going well in both codes. They knocked Nemo Rangers out of the football last weekend, so they wouldn't mind knocking out the, the other county champions in the other code, Black Rock, this weekend. And Black Rock were on telev television against St. Finbar's a couple of weeks ago, and they were quite impressive. I have to say, a real team that plays for each other and never give up and uh, just I thought they were really good obviously with Alan Connolly and likes Robbie Cotter in the, fo in the forward line Yeah we talked uh, earlier about um, or in the previous show about you know results that could help change seasons and things like that they were obviously beaten by Aaron's own weren't they in their first game but that win that win the last day has definitely turned things around I think Fergal Ryan is over them uh, everyone will remember him as uh, the car corner back in the late, late 90s early noughties uh, Douglas, though, it's time for probably Douglas to deliver, isn't it? Mm. Um, with the with the quality that they have uh, between Brian Turnbull, the two Cadigans, Alan and Owen, and Shane Kingston, and a couple more that I that I can't think of offhand, they have loads of talent. They have enough talent to be competing in county finals most years, and haven't been in a county final that I that I can remember. Uh, over the last decade I don't think they have been anyway if they have it's it definitely flew under the radar with me so that's to me that's the most uh, that's the most interesting game of the weekend in Cork and that's some that's saying something considering the Glen against Imo Killy should be really really interesting Imo Killy is an interesting one too do they, they can they come into the power rankings because it's a divisional side probably not no, because they can't come out. The, like yeah. They won the three in a row and they were never allowed to represent the, the county. Did they win that in 2019? They won the three in a row. Obviously, they have really good players in there. Like 10 clubs to choose from. And just a couple of the names I was reading on the Cork Echo, they include like Kieran Joyce, Colin Barry, William Leahy, Shane Ogo Regan, who looks a really good player underage or has done. The Lawton brothers, Brian and Barry and John Cronin. So not everyone would have heard of all those players, but they'd certainly be well respected down in Cork. And then Glen Rovers, of course. Sure, Hoggy by Patrick Horgan, Dean Brosnan, 
Stephen McDonald, I'm sure, is still lording it there at full back. And actually, in McKilly would also have Seamus Harney. Obviously, I have to mention him too. I think he'd missed a couple of games with injury. But they have a nice little selection there. Um, Aaron's own against Middleton should be interesting. There was a great goal from Robbie O'Flynn. That was, uh, I think there was a clip doing the rounds there a while back. You were saying that Hero Murphy's still playing. Middleton have uh, Connor Lahan all to themselves this year. And after speaking with Ben O'Connor, who's their manager earlier in the earlier in the summer, he was saying that he's just in serious shape and probably he can spend the full year building the team around him rather than trying to how do I accommodate and bring back this county player late on in the year when I kind of have my setup going pretty well at this stage. Yeah, it's a really hard one when you know a lot of your your team structure is built around your best player and you don't have them for long stages of the year. How, what do you do with your practice matches? Who are you going playing in practice yeah. matches? Can you get really competitive games uh, and then you have him back for a small window when the county is finished? Whereas now, as you said, he's gotten a clean run with it the whole year. They obviously won a county title. I think it was four or five years ago, um, and he was instrumental in that. So, yeah, that that's, again, there are three interesting quarterfinals. The reason I think you were saying uh, there's only three quarterfinals is the Sarsfields have earned a bye into the, sem- into the semi-finals. So that's the reason there's only three. And the relegation game will be interesting enough to carry two. Uh, I wonder, is Niall McCarthy still going strong? Niall McCarthy, who boxed for... Uh, he fought for an Irish title in the ring a couple of years ago. I remember interviewing him. He was still hurling at the time as well. They're going up against Charleville. Um, obviously, uh, Dara Fitzgibbon would be the main man with Charleville. We hurled them all earlier on the year. They're not a bad side. They tend to play a real possession kind of base style. But uh, Carrick Tool won a county title, I'm going to say, about a decade ago, I'd say as well. Totally against the grain. It was around the time Brewery won one in Limerick. There were a couple of kind of strange county champions there for a couple of years. But that'll be another interesting game. And uh, yeah, lots to play for there in Cork. You'd be hard pressed to, um, uh, you'd probably be making them your kiddie, the marginal favourites kind of coming in, but like it wouldn't be a big departure to think that, you know, in McKilly, the Rockies, Douglas, the Glen, and that's not to mention Sarsfields are in the semi finals already. It's a, it is a very, very open championship with open hurling played also. Yeah, I'm going to go with Black Rock to win it at this stage. Interesting question in from Dan Delaney, who was looking to talk about the Leash Championship, but this question is about the Offaly one. Would Verney consider Ryan as or Cool Derry or KK as a Kilcormac Kalahi as Leinster contenders if either could come out of Offaly? Look, we'll throw, we'll throw Burr in there as well. But anyway, yeah. would, would you take the point? Uh, he's asked me a straight question, so I'll give him a, a straight answer. He didn't. He didn't mention Burr in the question, so I just said yeah. what he asked me the question. Uh, Rhinos are going for three in a row this year, and disappointed uh, in sixteen when they won. They were beaten well, I think, by Euler Tabala a week or two after. They disappointed in nineteen. They were beaten by Rathdowney Earl. So I'd imagine that they would be keen to go on a run in Leinster, and they're a very very solid side. And they've a good kind of size profile that would suit winter hurling. So, yeah, it's, I don't know about contenders because you're still looking at who comes out with Kilkenny a lot of time and potentially sure. Kula coming out with Dublin. But probably, yeah, and Burr, obviously. Good man, Don. Or Dan, sorry. Good man. Um, I, I'd still say the Kilkenny Championship, the Dublin Championship, uh, would be a good bit ahead of us. And I think we're a bit behind from when you know, when we got to the club final in 08 or when Kildare got to the final in 12 or when Kilcormick got to it in 13. Like, the last time Kilcormick got to the Leinster final, he gave them a fair pasting, uh, which would suggest that maybe the standard of our county championship is a bit off a couple of the other ones in Leinster. So we've, uh, we'd have a, we'll have a bit to find, I'd say. Yeah, and then Rapparees are obviously waiting in the wings for the last number of weeks at this yeah. stage. It would have been, like, unbelievably lovely sod when they were playing their county championship and it's going to be probably desperate enough weather in a few weeks time when they get going in the Leinster Championship. So they're a small I, team as well, like a lot, a lot of forwards are small, nippy, Lenny Connolly and these guys are small, nippy forwards. Be interested to see what they're doing. A lot of them would be kicking football with Starlights, which is the name, like it's Rapparees, rap, rap, Starlights and they're, they actually hold the two county titles at the moment. But, what are the hurlers doing that only play hurling at the moment? Like, what are they doing? Like, are, I presume they're just solely trained for football and the hurlers are off doing something by themselves or something, but it's an interesting one. Yeah, and let, let me just see. I, w- I wouldn't put the Offaly... I don't think the, an Offaly team will win the Leinster Club title this year, but I think they can give a decent bash. I mean, under day, Ballyhale can absolutely batter abs- anybody. 
But I think they give most teams a good shout, a good shot in there. By the way, the Westmead semi-final is on this weekend. Clon Kill are against Castletown. Repeated last year's um, final, says Jack Nulty. Uh, they'll play Raharney in the final. Uh, he says he knows not many are interested in, but Westmead club isn't bad. And yes, they've obviously staged a few uh, surprise wins, I suppose, in most cases over the years, haven't they? Yeah, I think Raharney, uh, I think it was from straight from the group stages that Raharney got through to the county final, whatever way they ran it this year. Because I remember I was looking at it in the group stages. We were doing a roundup for the independent and I didn't realise that someone could actually qualify for the final as a result of the group stages. Um but that's that's obviously what happened, and yeah, Raharney of Raharney beat Kulderi, uh years ago. Didn't they beat? Did they beat someone in Dublin before as well? In yeah, Bally Borden. Yeah, and Clonkill ran. Didn't Clonkill run Borden on a Wednesday night to extra time? I think uh, a couple of years ago as well when Bally Borden ended up in the Leinster final. So definitely, they definitely uh, between those two between those two teams we've mentioned, throw Castletown Gagan into the mix as well. Um, there's lots of you know, there's three or four really strong teams in Westmead. Mm, the least semi-finals are also on this weekend. Commerce against uh, Burris Kilcotton and Clock Balakala meet Rat Downey Earl. I think these are going to be tasty games. There could be killings in here. Who knows? But, uh, you know, after winning the delayed 2020 final, you know, for Clock Balakala, they've had a comfortable win over Burris Kilcotton and they've eased through a group of big wins over the Harps, Rose Nallis and uh, Castletown. Picky Matters obviously lording it for them as he has been for a long time. Stephen Miller doing some great stuff uh, in Leash today in terms of like uh, go and have a look there if you want to get a more in-depth look of what's going on in that um, in that championship there. So th- as I said, Clock Valley Colla are going to be up against Rat Downey Earl. And wasn't the big thing there that Mark Cavanagh got injured again? He had one two scored the last day, and then I think it's it wasn't it a shoulder injury that that um, you know that's going to keep him out for a while. You just wonder how many injuries can a man take. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly the nature of the injury, but uh, I believe he was not long back on the scene. And to, to go down with something like that, and I believe, believe it looked serious enough anyway, definitely going to be under pressure to, to play this weekend. Ah, it's, it's heartbreaking. I, I've been there with injuries, as have you in recent years. It's a real killer. But particularly for a lad like Mark Kavanagh, like Jesus, at, when he's fit and healthy, he's some, he's some player. Jesus Christ, he's like he's a brilliant talent, and I just love that left-handed style. I just love that when a lad is flying well, he's a real good free taker as well. And Leash have really missed him uh, over the last while. He only played bits and pieces in Eddie Brennan's last year. Didn't play at all last year. And whatever about him being a loss for Leash, he'd be some loss for Rat Downey if it looks like he's going to miss this weekend. I was surprised, I have to say, that the Clock Balakala won uh, last year's championship. We had played them a few times ourselves. And they're they're a good side, but they've obviously improved an awful lot, and they've obviously carried that improvement into this year because they've been the best team in Leash so far this year, and uh, they'd definitely be favourites for two in a row at the moment. But again, could you confidently call them beating Rat Downey? If Mark Cavan is out, you probably could call it a bit more confidently. I would say. Yeah. So Boris Kilcotton, I mean, again, just looking at some of what Stephen Miller was reporting in Leash today. Things weren't looking great when they lost the 2021 league final, the 2020 delayed championship final, and then only scraped the draw against Abbey Leeds in the first round of the championship. They've since had wins over Commerce and Rat Downey Earl, so they're obviously back here again. PJ Scully, who we've seen back with Leash this year and looking really good, he scored 229 of the three games coming up to now. Uh, obviously, they're g- going to be up against it with uh, Commerce to Zane Keenan, who for a while was lighting it up on the inter county stage. He's put up some big scores here. Um, I'd, I'd say most people would be looking at Boris Kilcotton to win this game, though, wouldn't they? Just about, I'd say. Just about. Uh, tough game to call. Camelot's obviously missed out on the knockout stages last year, and I know that was um, that was really disappointing for them, and it was the first time in a long, long time that they'd missed out on the, the knockout stage. I think they won the minor earlier on in the year, um, so confidence is probably high within the club. Probably just be favouring Boris Kilcotton. Um, and just on the Rat Downey thing, obviously we mentioned before, Shane Keegan, the ex-Dundalk manager, is managing Rat Downey. So that adds another kind of interesting plot to that story. Yeah, without doubt it does. I think that's it. We have it all covered for the show. If we left anything out, please do leave the comments in. We'll try and get to it to the next time. Uh, a reminder, please do subscribe to the channel, bottom right-hand corner. I know it always, I always say, but it's so important. Half the people who watch the show don't subscribe so we could get over that 10,000 quickly if people uh, wouldn't mind doing that and it's absolutely free to do it uh, if you want to do uh, five euro a month patreon to get the audio podcast and support the channel please do do that also patreon.com forward slash our game 
that's it. We've it all covered, and we'll chat again uh, at the end at the far side of the weekend, Mike. I am all Henryed out. I don't know about you anyway. So looking forward to a break now, and looking forward to a few games over the weekend. Absolutely. All right. Thanks very much. We'll chat to you all again soon. Cheers, Shane. The Hurling Show, brought to you in association with Torpy. Torpy are leading hurling into a new future with Bamboo, a revolutionary hurley created using their unique engineered hurling performance know-how. Already being used by many inter-county players, Torpy's Bamboo is highly sustainable, offers players greater striking distance and a more consistent balance every time, without compromising on natural feel. Check them out on the Torpy website and in the link below and enter the promo code OURGAME to get yourself 10% off.